dun, 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 dropping the finger. Dun, 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 dun. New season. Yeah, Same right. Bad jokes. <laughs> uh, well, I see. I see. We can take two months off, and uh, nothing actually changes, does it? No, uh, no. In fact. I am fairly certain that the Unabridged Gamer has sat in that exact same spot <laughs> every other week, despite the fact that we weren't here, finding different opportunities to uh, to play around with those toys we are right. in preparation for this moment. That makes it all fit. I, I have no idea what you're, pl you're implying. I mean, truly, exactly it's not what like I have multiple cast members on hand at any given point. The, the judging so, phase. I like Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone, welcome to the Noobcast podcast for the 13th of October, 2019. My name is Miss Michelle Jean, and we are joined by the Noobcast crew themselves. Uh, everyone, welcome back. It's good to see you all. Have us all it's in one place. It's good to be here. Yeah. Have you gotten a tan? Did I get a tan? Yeah. I was in Southern California for two weeks. You can't help but get a tan when you're there for that long. <laughs> Especially when you're walking around... TwitchCon right on the beach. Yeah. Oh, God, that was gorgeous. I, oh, this, I loved it. This is the most tan I have been in years. <laughs> <laughs> right. I suppose with that said, uh, Ipo, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm really good, and it's great to be here back with you guys. Yeah. I missed you guys, so good to just, like, actually be together on a podcast again it's been a long time since i've been on a podcast it's been like three months thought you guys were uh, gonna recast <laughs> me for Walrus <Walrenonymous>. anonymous <laughs> elijah's got that he's got that eye on Walrus anonymous and i'm i mean look You're look not gonna face. lie i could have just put the the hippo uh image up and just be like nope look we're we're good right just, just get somebody like somebody with like a completely different voice Oh Hi, it's me, Hip Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, he's on to us. Shit. Yeah, Playing the role of Hip I'll, Anonymous this I'll, week will be. We would just do this and have the hippo there and everything would be fine. Right? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you think we could get Flying Bolts to do it? Oh, yes. I, I think Bolts cool. would be a great <laughs> impersonator. He has enough of a beard to pull it off. I think oh, Bolts would jump at the chance to be me on a <laughs> podcast. <laughs> And say things in your name. Uh, yes, absolutely. See, I just gotta find some mm -hmm. fun pictures too, like you. I've known Bolts for like a, over like a year and a half. I'm sure he could be me for a day, for a few hours. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> gosh, Hippo, what have you been? What have you been up to? What's going on your way? Dude, so much stuff. Play it out, dude. So much stuff. We 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 had the uh, TwitchCon like two weeks ago, mm -hmm. which was insane. It was so much fun. Mm -hmm. I got to I got to hang out with so many wonderful people streamers i'm not uh i got recognized which was like a very weird thing for me uh i'm just a dude yeah. on the internet so <laughs> dude isn't it was that, kind of like that is such hey, a weird experience the internet. It, it was hey that's the dude from the internet that i watch every night get a you got a selfie with him what the heck yeah and i was like okay <laughs> i i suspect um, you had that too hard i i had that once uh, it was on Sunday yeah. night. I was coming down the elevator and or, uh, at the the gas lamp Marriott, and all of a sudden, one of the people in the elevator is like, "Miss Michelle Jean," and by that point, my badge was off. So I was like, "Yeah, yeah, that's me." Hi, it was it was Brinzy. Oh, I didn't even know he was there. Yeah, he was there. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. There were so many people at at this this TwitchCon, but. There was a lot of people who didn't go because I think they were burned out on um, the Lion Con of yeah. last year, of 2017, uh, 18. 18. I wasn't even yeah. there, and I was burned out on Lion Con. Yeah. Um, this year, perfect. There was no line problems. It was very quick. Um, we got there at 11 o'clock on purpose because I had, like, day zero, which is Thursday is what people call it, day zero. Yeah. And uh, And then Friday... We got there at 11 because I was like, I don't want to deal with lines, but if there is a line, eh, at least I'm awake and I got some sleep. We just walked right in. Yep. It was not a problem at all. Yep. Uh, so good job, Twitch and uh, the uh, San Diego event staff. You guys are amazing. And uh, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, no, you're absolutely yeah. right. It was so good. And uh, 
and so many people i think after leaving the convention all were saying like trying to find things that was like what could be improved i was like well <laughs> i mean there's probably a couple things but you guys made such a leaps and bounds over last year that it's really hard to zero in on exactly what could be improved from this year you know well you know the the event staff was so so good at what they did they had another con uh, convention like farther down the convention center so it was like twitchcon and then another convention and there was just no lines there was just a bunch of nerds hanging out at twitchcon and then yep. like a bunch of dudes in business suits walking around going what the hell is happening here <laughs> yeah <laughs> which was very awkward uh by the way they, so, they were very arrogant and well some of them were very arrogant in walking and it was very strange what was uh for you since you were there what was one of the moments that uh when someone instantly recognized you and uh that like you actually had the chance to meet in person for the first time what was one of those uh, people and what was it like for you literally the first the first person that i met besides Cavis and uh sammy um we were walking to badge pickup on thursday and we were walking past this like stair area where like a bunch of people were sitting and i wasn't paying attention to that because there was a dude on my left as i was like passing he started talking about rage tweeting and how he he normally doesn't rage tweet blah 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 but I could hear him in my left ear, and I was listening as I was walking past, going, "What the hell is this guy talking about?" Like he was he was screaming it basically, very loud, and I was like, "What is happening over here?" And then on my right, I hear like I hear some someone screaming as well, but not like, yeah, I, I'm not paying attention. All of a sudden, I get tackled. It's Spartan Stew from the Hot <laughs> Potato Crew um, in RimWorld, and then like Flying Bolts, Barra Sarah, just like a bunch of people, and nice. I was like. Oh hey everyone, like FG is here. <laughs> like, oh, I was I just didn't hear them and they were like making fun of me and I was like, I was listening to the conversation. You guys never listen to people's conversations <laughs> as you're walking by, like, what the fuck is your life? <laughs> that's uh, nice. That's, that's how it went for me. Nice. Um, that was like the first, I don't know, 30 seconds of being at the the venue. So that was really awesome. You, so you had one of those of two. That's so cool. I love that that it it's like very awkward, I have to say, when people stream without cams and I'm friends with them, and then they, like, run up to me, and I don't know who they are, and they, like, give me this hug, and I'm like, hello, random person that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, no, it's me. I'm like, oh, it's you. Okay, that makes sense, because uh -huh. I had no idea what you look like. So That's even even if I do know what... Yeah, like, even if I do know what you look like, I still, like... I see you on a screen like you're that big. You know, yeah. Oh, I guess you're that big. And so yeah. seeing you in person is very... Um, it takes me a minute to, like, put the face to the face, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Like, I definitely went, like, through TwitchCon this year being like, I know that person, but I can't remember their name. But I know that person as well, and I don't remember their name. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Yeah. My uh, brain can only do so much, okay? You know, it, it's very scattered. There's so many people. Uh, gosh, yeah, the, there's a few days. There's a few interactions, a few moments where it's just like, oh, hey. Like, I think I told you about uh, one of the other ones I had. I know on, on Friday, no sooner did I get into the show floor. Uh, and just a few moments in, I just feel a, a grab on my arm. It was a, like not like a hard one, but just a like a, hey, I'm right here type of, of grab. I turn. And it's uh it's Elspeth and she's like, I just want to give you a quick hug, say hi, and I'm going outside. I'm like, hi, bye. You know, one of those things when it's like, ah, what? It was such a cool experience. Just being recognized. Being recognized feels you know, so hmm. Michelle, I'm about to name drop chat. Are you ready? Go for it. <laughs> so Ooh. so I get this this text message, right? From Michelle. And I look at it and it's a it's a picture <laughs> with her and Dodger. And she's like, see what I got? So I was like, where is she? And she told me she's in the art area. So yeah. I went out there. And when we got there, there was like three people just kind of talking with Dodger. And then they left. And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I could talk to Dodger. What do I even say? Yeah. <laughs> so I walked well, up to I Dodger. And I'm like, she's being a very artful Dodger. Literature. <laughs> I was just like, understand that <sighs> I was like, Dodger, my friend showed me a picture that you guys took together and 
she was like, ha, 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 look at this picture. And I, I came to get a, a selfie with you. And she's like, oh, Miss Michelle Jean? I was like, yes. Yes, it was her. <laughs> so uh, I, got a, I got a picture with Dodger. And I was yeah. just like, take this, Michelle. <laughs> but she was so sweet to talk to, too. I'm, mm -hmm. I just kind of I, I had a small conversation. And then I just I got to the, before this gets too awkward, I'm just ramble. I'm just going to head and just part now but thank you for for your time and and uh yeah it was a great yeah. conversation was her uh it was uh, I, because i know that you hung out with some of the communities that you hung out with i know that i was i like i hung out with some of the girl streamers uh girl streamers inc uh over the weekend uh the crew rp like my first day <clears throat> my day zero uh crafty and i show up at the convention center we're outside and all of a sudden this guy runs up and he's like hey i'm like uh, hi and he had that moment of hesitation like oh shit did i run up to the wrong person and he's like no damn it i'm committed to this he's like yeah imperial I'm like oh shit it's imperial oh, I'm, jedi yeah, i'm an imperial a couple of times yep yeah oh Just god he was all over the place him. imperial <laughs> imperial jedi was all over the fucking place but mm -hmm. yeah he committed to it I'm like, i loved his i loved his outfit on, on thursday <laughs> uh the jacket mm -hmm. yeah yeah he said he had like a whole outfit it was just like jet uh imperial imperials i don't remember exactly i was drunk so i don't remember exactly like oh, the detail in it but it was just like a bunch of like helmets and stuff all mm -hmm, over mm -hmm. i know what you're talking about yeah so yeah we're, we're uh for dizza and the Anna bridge gamer you're just enduring our twitchcon conversation because that's happened since the last episode and thank I'm you for your patience and nodding everything is fine <laughs> i mean i feel i feel like nothing has changed <clears throat> I, I've, I've got a strong <laughs> association and appreciation for dodger so definitely definitely struck a moment for me yeah and you know what name drops because we we had a chance to interact with those people and uh I think part of the reason why it's like, look, there's one, there's still people. So, you know, they, they're doing what they're doing. They had their chances to meet people they wanted to as well. Um, but because ultimately we just respect the hell out of them. You know, the names I dropped, I, I mean, respect the hell out of them. If it wasn't for Dodger, Jesse, um, Total Biscuit, like that whole crew, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. I would never mm -hmm. been inspired to do what I do. So mm -hmm. if it wasn't for them, it, so it was, it was like really cool to just meet some, someone that, I've watched since 2013, maybe 2012. Yeah, some, some very long time ago. Something like that. You know? Yeah, I, I had mentioned when I first found her. She's like, "Damn, that's that's been a while." I'm like, yeah, yeah, seven, eight years. <clears throat> so yeah, so TwitchCon that was a thing. Uh, so what did you two losers do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was gonna ask, what have you? Have, what I have love you, you guys. Played, I'm though? sorry. <laughs> Hold on, though. what have you actually played though? Besides uh, uh, con convention goer, what else did you play? Clearly, he's been playing the longest con. <laughs> oh, God. You know what? I know I don't normally do sound effects for the show, but just for that one, just that for that one, you, you get a rim shot. Because you, you don't get to hear it, I don't think, but it, trust me, it's there. Oh, I believe it. I can feel it. I can feel it. And it oh, no. Marvelous. <laughs> That hurt. Yeah, Hippo, what have you actually been playing? Uh, lots of RimWorld. We played <laughs> games. Wow. <laughs> we, played of, we played a lot of um, Euro Truck. Uh, we played, we played, well, I mean, a long time ago, we played uh, Cooking Simulator. That came out. That was a lot of fun. Um, Euro Truck, gosh. by the way. That still needs to happen. That hasn't happened I agree. all summer. Uh, oh, Untitled Goose Game. Fantastic. Very fun. Um, Ooh. I, people... I've heard so much. I, I've yet to play it, but it sounds absolutely amazing. How, how has it been for you? So pretty much everyone in chat essentially said, I think the developers made a game for you. Um <laughs> I think what sums up Goose Game is, like, I saw a meme where it's, like, developers asking, do people really want to play an evil character in a game? And then they made Goose Game, and everyone, it sold more copies than Link's Awakening. So uh, the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> chonk, indeed. <laughs> oh, we, uh, we, we checked out Crying Sons, which is a fantastic, oh. um, like roguelike space game somewhat like ftl with um 
like strategy mechanics very fun for combat um gosh I, there's so uh, many games that we played you um, played that one evolution game too didn't you the oh yeah ancestors the humankind odyssey which yeah. developers what an awful name like i cannot remember it for the life of me because it's such a wordy uh, a wordy title that I was trying, I, I've been to the dentist a lot recently, and I was trying to tell him, because he's like, oh, what do you do? And so I told him, and he's like, oh, that's really cool, what have you been playing? And I was like, a monkey game? He's like, a <laughs> monkey game? I'm like, all right, look, let me, just sit down, sit down, because I, I need you to sit, because it's going to take a while. Uh, so I had a captive audience. <laughs> um, you that, really was, that was that was fun. Um, if you think that's a bad name, Try to say repeatedly, the church in the darkness, over and over and over again in a single take. Because someone thought okay. that the infinite number of thes was critical. Da, 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 da. Yes. Da, 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 da. Tongue got tied so many times. Phenomena. There we go. Um, we played a lot of stuff. Uh, we played like the Hunter Call of the Wild, which is a is one of those Zen games for me. There's like guilty pleasures that I it, it, it was like it's like Euro Truck, you know, mm -hmm. when I when I'm I'm, like, I'm having a bad day and I'm like kind of stressed out and I just want to Zen out kind of veg out and time travel. I play Euro Truck. The Hunter Call of the Wild is also one of those games where you kind of just go hiking and you get to explore a beautiful map that the developers have created. It's gorgeous. They they did an amazing job on that game. Mm -hmm. uh, also destroys your computer's uh, GPU. Uh, and sometimes CPU as well. Um, oh. But it's on the PlayStation. It's on all the consoles and stuff. So okay. uh, I bought it on the PlayStation, and it's fantastic. I love it. It plays basically the exact same thing, like, the exact same way. Mm -hmm. um, I played Stardew Valley, you guys. For the first time since I stream started streaming, I played I've Stardew Valley again. Noticed a few people streaming that again. In fact, it's really mm -hmm. interesting to see that Isn't resurgence. Co-op update? <clears throat> Wait, uh, I don't know if there was. I've yet to actually I've... play it. What? I I suggest playing it. It's yes. it's a great game. Um, Absolutely. But I kind of burned myself out on it. I I played it when I first started streaming. I played it like hundreds of hours and. I, I got really burned out, so yeah. I just, I was like, I just the thought of going back to Stardew kind of made me go, oh, I don't want to do that anymore. Yep. It's been a year. It's been like two and a half years, but uh, I went back to it finally. And I just streamed it for like a little while, and I really enjoyed it. So I was thinking about bringing it back because uh, it's a it's a fantastic game, and I think I've spent enough time away from it. So. Uh, yeah, you know it's uh. I, I got the same experience. I think we did something pretty similar on each other's channels. I because I had the same experience, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it it is a good game, and yeah, there is a multi. That's I, that was a good point too. Was it uh, Elijah that you brought it up? The multiplayer, the, since the multiplayer uh <clears throat> portion or the what would you call it was added. Uh, a lot of the Stardew streams I see are multiplayer. Oh, Stardew Valley, yeah, it was like one of the most yeah. requested things people had. It was like, yep. mm -hmm. but it didn't come out go. for like two years. Mm -hmm. Fair, making networking work across how many different systems? Yeah, yeah, I mean, fair, but he didn't have to do it himself, and yet he he really wanted to do it himself. Mm -hmm. But I think I think eventually he hired other people, right? The Stardew Valley developer now it's like four people or something. This is yeah, how Mojang really started. Triple A. Yeah. <laughs> the excess has so gotten to him. The the amount of money he's made, I feel like he could have just hired a, like another person and like doubled, <laughs> you know, like doubled the time. But you know, I get it. It's his baby. He. It's like um, I think his name is Tynan for Rimworld. Yeah, I think Rimworld is essentially like him and only him. Mm -hmm. And it's like. Taking it's taken many years for um, it's taken many years for that game to really come to par. Mm -hmm. Um, but it it's a great game. It's a great game. But again, it could have been done, and lots more could have been made for it a long time ago. Right. 
I think we have to be critical of games that we love, not in a horrible way, not in a like, screw you developer, but in a like, this could be better. We love it the way it is, but it could be better. There's nothing Absolutely. Wrong with, yeah, there's nothing wrong with uh, critiquing things that we appreciate. There's nothing wrong with that at all. I mean, um, as long as we realize that, you know, there's a good chance and easiness for bias in what we're saying, because either we're a fan for or, sure. yeah. But um if we talk about it objectively and just kind of have facts as to why mm -hmm. <clears throat> and other people can understand that then yeah we should absolutely do I mean, that we're we're seeing it from like a a, a user point of view and not a developer point right. of view so right who knows what's happening behind the scenes so you know there's always reasons why people do what they do developers do what they do so but yeah that's pretty much all i've been playing i i, I I started this year going, okay, last year I bought like almost 100 games to play on stream. This year I'm going to play one game for like a month and just see how it goes. And I've been really on RimWorld. So uh, I, I've been playing a lot of RimWorld. And, you know, I think I'm going to go back to The Sims, you guys. I feel a little burnt out on it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check it out. Oh, uh, well, I mean, when you decide to do it, I'd be to see how it sounds. Soul, soul. Oh, dear. All right. Uh, does it cover it all? Is that everything you played? Probably not, but it's been three months, and uh, we were like yeah. 30 minutes into the uh, the podcast, so I, I think we should be talking <laughs> to good. some other amazing people here as well. I, I don't disagree. Uh, with that said, I suppose we'll go over to the other person who's had a lot. Well, I suppose we all have a lot that's gone on. But um, I know that you've had some big things go on. So, uh, Mr. Unabridged Gamer, Elijah, welcome to the show. How are you doing? What is going on? And what have you been playing? What is going on is, <laughs> um, to give the extremely condensed, oh, goodness me, version, um, this is me officially announcing that I am now managing an era of fail streams. This is also me officially announcing that I am no longer managing an era of fail streams. So that happened. Um, uh, and uh, I want to just say, for the brief time that fail streams was a thing, we actually put together a really, really kick-ass website, and I wish all the rub people there the best. And then my career took another turn in that, oh, by the way, I now have a column at The Escapist, and uh, I'm doing reviews there. My, my first video review should be going up soon. Uh, with regards to uh, Indivisible, and also um, did a review of The Surge 2 that nobody liked because, ironically, I was complaining about Souls like being too damn easy. Mm. Which is just, it, it, like, seriously, that is The Surge 2's problem. It's so easy to break its mechanics because understand, you understand in a Souls like you have a limited amount of health that you can regenerate, and you normally have to be very conservative about that. Well, in The Surge 2, Every time you deal attack, it it gives you extra battery, and battery charges fill your health. So you can be all DPS and all agility, be punching someone for a few minutes, back up quickly, instantly refill every single health thing, and then just go right back at it. There's like mm -hmm. no, it's it's not a combat loop so much as it is it is a boomerang. You just mm -hmm. kind of stretch back and then smack right back into it. Uh, so yeah, Bungie, also a very appropriate analogy there. So that was a thing. Um, on top of all of this, Unabridged Gamer got thrown through a bit of the ringers, which is why the October content is uh, still on the way. It's still coming together, but um, it's obviously there's been a lot of other things happening. I yeah. am very happy, though, because for the column for The Escapist, a second look, I basically get to do what I've been doing on Unabridged Gamer this whole time, but with an audience that, you know, is more than the couple odd people who actually managed to find my channel. Um, in fact, I'm surprised to say it's because of readers at The Escapist, which, thank you for that. My first column piece was about the Bureau X Comedy <laughs> Classified, because there were actually, I understand, I did a Gears 5 piece, and I just offhandedly mentioned the Bureau, and suddenly every comment was about the little offhand bit about the Bureau instead of actually about the Gears 5 piece. Everybody was like, yeah, yeah Gears 5 is great and all, but yeah, <laughs> why don't we talk about this? So I, I, I turned to the editor and I'm like, so I think maybe we should do this. And I think it was like by the fifth comment in a single day, someone was referring to it, it was like, 
okay, yeah, okay, that's your first one. And I'm happy to say it had a really good reception, so that was awesome. And I recently got to talk about Doom 3 like I was a while back on here. And just, that's, it, there's really good stuff happening there. And also, in terms of new things, a very generous friend of mine, who um, <laughs> I just want to say here, Insomniac Games, you should thank this man, because he really wants me to play this. Seriously, this is why I have a, it was like, you have not played this yet? And it's like, no, what, I don't have a What PS4. is that? I can't see it. <laughs> it's Ratchet and Clank, the PS4 remake uh, of the first game. Yeah. And speaking of which, I've never played I would, that either. I would like to talk to Sony. Because oh, I, I think a lot of us would love to have a conversation with Sony. <laughs> I, I have some questions. As some we all thoughts. do. Okay, so I have to ask. Was an intern's cousin in charge of this user interface design? Because it feels like I'm doing origami while drunk navigating this user interface. <laughs> what, you don't like drunken origami? No, I don't like drunken origami. And, you know, I do love that there's this folder function, but why is there only one place to select all the things that go in the folder and everything else it's one at a time? Do you, do you, was it meant to feel like a turn-based strategy game? Actually, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Also, yeah, um, why did we make having multiple accounts on the PS4 <laughs> more complicated than the PS3, even though you want people to still share accounts? Is well, it... more is more, clearly. Even if it's more complicated. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, finally, very big question <laughs> here. Um, it's very critical. How on earth, and I do mean this, how on earth am I supposed to see this light bar? How am I supposed to see it, Sony? It's always facing away from me. It's a big smiley face pointed at my screen. Well, we have a few options for that. You could turn the lights off and ruin your eyes. <laughs> and then not be able to play our games in the future. We didn't think about this one that far ahead. But you could do that, and you probably would see it still. Or you could get a piece of paper and put it right there at the end of the controller <laughs> and let that light be your guide. You'll have to, fi you'll have to figure it out, and once you do, take a picture for us and share it with us. <laughs> oh. But afterwards, we will, we will buy the rights to it and uh, sell it for $20 a piece of cardboard. <laughs> oh, I'm, I, would have, I would have no that. I do want to say, though, in, in this thing's cred, the most underrated feature is using the motion thing for typing? That is so nice! Why does no one talk about that? That is so much easier! My gosh! Because, like, there's the option of using this, and, like, we were even saying this before the cast, this is not intuitive. This, this is just... I don't know who at Sony has such a hard-on for touchscreens, but, like, look, guys, the Wii U beat, the Wii U beat you to it. <laughs> The Wii U a late on that one. <laughs> you do it. Just let it go. Just let it go. <laughs> but um, uh, I will say that um, uh, just you know, overall, it's it's kind of actually been surreal for me because everyone's talked about how the PS4 is this like critical system that you need to have it to play all the games and it really hasn't felt like that to me. Like, it's not bad, but it feels actually like the most stripped-down offering of any of the consoles right now. Even the Switch seems to have <laughs> more stuff going on, whereas the PS4 just sort of is like, this is a really great machine if I want to play a lot of single-player-only games that are very third-person and very cinematic. And, like, that's fine. Like, Spider-Man PS4 has been an amazingly enjoyable experience, sure. but it's also kind of just okay like it's like it's an acceptable baseline of this is good uh, so let me but... ask you this though would you consider yourself primarily a pc gamer um i would consider myself platform agnostic like realistically i will no like seriously no, i love I'm that just... description but please continue like i i uh, i mean for crying out loud i have Call of Duty Ghosts on both the 360 and the Wii U because I would like the 360 one at least had all the DLC bundled in for stupidly cheap, but 
the Wii U is how I prefer to play it personally with the Wiimote and Nunchuck. Like, there's some stuff that I absolutely want to play just on PC, but there's other games where I would say, nah, it doesn't really fit there. And that is the one thing I will say about a lot of the Sony games that I've been experiencing is that most of them I don't really see being, like, you know, built for PC in mind or something like that. You can feel... There's a certain aesthetic quality to the controls and everything, which is the same sort of deal for a while with Microsoft games that's only just starting to change now. Like, Gears 5, I can easily see playing that on my PC, but, like, the preceding Gears games, no, they felt awkward as hell on PC. They clearly were not built with it in mind, so I pretty much will play a game on its intended platform and or work around the headache if I need to record it, like, you know, trying to do Resistance Burning Skies with like DualShock 3 is a little bit more tedious than doing it with a proper handheld, but, you know, there's stuff like that. But just, I wouldn't say that I have any super strong allegiance to anywhere. I'm more excited with what Microsoft's going to be doing because they just have more developers that I like. They've got, like, Obsidian mm -hmm. and they've got Ninja Theory and that, so that's got me excited. But just, at this point... The console wars thing has actually kind of died out for me. I, I really just don't care so much about what platform it is, so long as they're offering the best games and the best reasonable prices for consumers. That's the, uh, the end of the day. That's what it really needs to be. Okay. Have you guys played uh, Destiny 2 on, on the PC? Um, yes. 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 I played on PC I... and on PlayStation. Now, that game is a mess when it comes to the UI. Just trying to accept people into your clan. Yeah. If they apply, you have to go to the website because there's no built-in option. Yeah. Good times. Well, that, that I was very frustrated with that last night. Although I, to be fair, it was also like five in the morning. One I don't have a problem. problem. You do. Well, <laughs> so I think to that point, uh, that might have been one of the directions that was given to uh, to Bungie. And, I mean, who knows what kind of directions that were given to them. I mean, there's a reason that they ended up ultimately departed Activision and the Blizzard launcher and now are on their own. They're on Steam now, which, by the way, the, the level that they had to go to to make that migration from the, from the Blizzard launcher to Steam and how well they did that overall... Yeah, I, did, I didn't have a problem with it. Yeah, no, it was, uh, I mean, I was doing it right at prime time. I had a couple small hiccups, but uh, overall, it was pretty painless. Uh, so the, the team over at, at Bungie deserves to be recognized for that particular effort. They did a great job, I think, overall, and in such it would a be short amazing period of time. If we get a redesign on the UI, though. Yeah. Just, just saying, just throwing it out there, I mean, Bungie, if you're someday. listening. I love okay. you, but soon tm what, what? soon <laughs> yeah. tm <laughs> i agree but also i know just how tedious uh, i've listened to ui designers talk about the work they have to go through for their stuff and like i can understand the headache of it like the last of us is user interface i think it went with close to a dozen different iterations before they were happy and then it was like a couple more when the player testers were happy because like for mm. sure for sure mm -hmm. so i could see that being something that's just sort of like it's something that um bungie wants to get to at some point but like for reference the uh the battlefront 2 team just recently held out a thing it's like so what would you like different about the user interface in star wars battlefront because fans have made mods every now and then but even for there it took them like two years to come around and be like so yeah, about this user interface, is there anything you'd like to see changed? And it's a fairly straightforward competitive shooter. Mm -hmm. So I can see that being what's maybe hold it up because I, I firmly believe that Bungie's been trying to make it better. Good to see they've already tried to improve it greatly from the first game where it was essentially like waiting for a printer to turn on to get access to that. But um, speaking of... uh. Things that are kind of clunky, but are still interesting and relevant. Mm -hmm. There was one game I wanted to bring up. Um, I, out of curiosity, since all of you have a PS4, has anyone here actually played Killzone Shadowfall? No. No. Kills Killzone was never a franchise that ever got my attention. Sorry, man. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's... No, 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 it's fine, because the thing is, I understand that a lot of people missed out on Shadowfall. 
Capcom when it first released because it was the launch shooter. That's all yeah. it was supposed to be. And yep. to be fair, as a competitive game, it kind of sucks. Like I was playing it with bots because there's no one online anymore. And it's like, yeah, not nah, Killzone Three was way better than this. But I think, in- I think with Killzone in general, what really didn't help it though was the fact that it was something to try to compete with Halo to bring people back to PlayStation and. No one, the the numbers just didn't support. Like, there wasn't an interest in general. There were people that bought it and played it, but just nothing like what they were expecting. So you're talking about playing with bots. That might have been a reason why. Hmm. Uh, while he's taking care of that, we'll go ahead and just swing around down, or I suppose in your eyes up to uh mr Dizza g welcome to the show how are you doing what have you been playing hey um i am uh, i'm back to about 87 percent health like out of my full health bar I've, I've had a lot of things going on for the past uh three months including um playing some survival strategy games and playing real life survival strategy games and mm. uh yeah so did you go I, camping? I did go camping, actually. Okay. Awesome. So, <laughs> so I played real life Don't Starve. Oh. Nice. How'd that go? Did you, did you starve? <laughs> um, I did not. I was well prepared beforehand, thankfully. You bring the s'mores? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it was purely a s'more diet. As and it hot dogs. Be. As it should be. <laughs> s'mores and slightly burnt hot dogs over the fire. Mwah. It is it is absolutely perfect. Um and of course friends proceeded to bring ketchup and use that as the only condiment for said hot dogs. Which I mean, <laughs> first off, when you're at a campfire, as it turns out, you don't have to be fancy. You really don't need to bring all the condiments like that. It, it's it's not worth the effort. But if you are going to bring a condiment, mm-hmm. really? Yeah. Yeah, ketchup. Ketchup's good. Really? Ketchup hands. Yeah. Ketchup looks good. <laughs> Is it not? Uh, okay, look, I'll take ketchup on a hot dog. I know that that's like blasphemy for like East Coasters, but that's better than mayo. I'll take ketchup on. Yeah, no mayo, dude. No mayo. Yeah, mayo, <laughs> <mayo's> gross. <laughs> yeah I, I don't think ketchup is an issue with East Coasters. It's it's the Chicago dog you have to watch out for. But interesting yeah. fact: if you are on the East Coast, you get very different hot dog buns. Your buns are cut the wrong way. They look like little, like, uh, split-top loaves of bread, almost. Versus the, the cut on the side. Yeah, you, you have to see them to know. Weird. But yeah, they're very, very strange here. So, I guess, okay, since you're playing uh, uh, Don't so, Starve, the other thing that we really need to know is, uh, uh, how long did it take you to craft your weapon? And what was it made from? <laughs> Because, I mean, look, we have serious questions here, Dizza. We have to know this stuff. <laughs> it is very unfortunate because there were rules in the campgrounds that we were on to not actually pick up any wood that was in the forest oh. and use that. Um, thankfully, somebody did bring some actual firewood, so mm-hmm. we proceeded to uh, make our, our makeshift uh, weapons off of that. Okay. Um, someone so- also was smart enough to bring kebabs for the s'mores and the hot dogs. So in in a, a moment pinch, you could like almost make shift javelin with them. They they were pretty large. the The temperature was the real concern. Mm. It went to like thirty three degrees that night. It's like thirty three, thirty four degrees. Not and mind you. This is the first time I've been camping since I was, like, eight. And camping at that point consisted of going into a tent in my parents' friend's backyard and hanging out. So, I will say with confidence, I was not adequately prepared for it. I remember at one point um, waking up from a dream of frost punk and thinking, wow, it's really (laughs) cold, and my legs just started shaking. Were you eating cedar chips by chance and sawdust? Possibly ac- accidentally amputated arms and legs? Um, we, we went the soup route. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was ultimately extremely dissatisfied. Mm. <laughs> As you are. 
But you're yes. supposed to wake up and then stoke the fire like every couple of hours, just saying. Oh. Um, <laughs> I know that like you guys probably didn't have like a hey, you were gonna wake up the first time and then you were gonna wake up and then you're gonna wake up or whatever, you know. Yeah. But usually you have enough uh, campfire or firewood to stoke the fire a few times overnight so that you don't and then have firewood mm -hmm. at, when you wake up so that you can warm up we didn't have the chance for the first rats um because the campgrounds we were at said a hard stop on having a campfire after i think 11 30. that's so, pretty rough that's pretty rough yeah so yeah frozen burrito diz nearly happened um thankfully i was whisked <laughs> away before it got too crazy um, but it was, it was absolutely horrendous. Um, so you, I also you, went like, on... what kind of sleeping bag did you bring? Well, I thought a sleeping bag that was like, it was supposed to be warmer. It's supposed to be like 40 degrees. And I'm like, oh, hey, this is tested for 40 degrees. This will be fine. Uh-huh. And I, I'm a, a pansy in cold weather in general. So I should have thought about that a little bit more and been like, you know what? I'll get the one that's negative 20 just in case. So you, you played the Don't Starve Real Life Edition. Mm. Yes. It was more like Don't Freeze? Yeah, that's what I'm gathering. So kind of, <laughs> kind of Frostpunk, kind of Don't Starve. Got it. Yeah, it was a nice little hybrid, really. Like, I, I could see that <laughs> turning into its own thing. Oh. Um, on top of that, thing. I've... I've been out hiking. Um, like the outdoors are a weird thing that I am now exploring. It's cool. I'm, um, I'm with you on that. Too. There are other people there. Yeah, I, I heard you're you're doing archery. Every Monday, Listen we go to... we go up to the mountains, go hiking, and do archery. Listen to so these weird cool. people doing healthy things. Look, I figure if you're <clears> gonna <throat> if you're gonna talk for eight hours a day, you damn well better do something other than play a video game because you're gonna run out of stuff to talk about really quickly. <laughs> mm. Not to mention, how are you supposed to take care of getting rid of all of your Pokeballs in Pokemon Go? <laughs> well, I live in well where I go, there's so. no Pokemon, unfortunately. Yeah, and I live in a pretty oh. populated building, so we get Pokemon here all the time. I'm good here. Yeah. Um, as a matter of games that I've been playing, uh, Frostpunk has been very good. Okay. And I love Frostpunk. It's such a good game. It's, it's so beautiful, and... Mm -hmm. Like you, you get the survival horror element to it. You get the the city control management um, element of it. I mean, you get it's it's such a beautiful puzzle strategy because there is a distinct timeline. Like you do have to get to certain results by a certain period of time, or your city is annihilated. And so it is really fun to try to optimize that and try to figure out how how to work the puzzle to your advantage. And um, haven't done a lot of it lately. I really want to get back into it. I, I definitely think it's one of those streamable games. It's a game that I have so much fun playing and yet at the same time, like, get so uncomfortable with because you have to make such tough decisions. I love those games. I love those type of games. Oh, those are, like, right up my alley, man. Makes me squirm every single time. I'm just like, Really? Really? We're just going to leave these guys out in, in a pile of snow yep. and maybe use their corpses later? Yep. That sounds uh, great. Yeah. <laughs> Accurate. I'm proud of what I'm doing. So That's that good. was a lot of fun. Um, okay. I have In the conversation from earlier, I have not played a lot of PS4 lately. The biggest thing that's been grabbing my attention on switch has been astral chain oh yes yep wonderful little game uh fantastic um action where you play uh, essentially you're moving two different characters at the same time and i've mm -hmm. loved games like that in the past like the world ends with you mm -hmm. i enjoyed uniquely for the fact that you're controlling two independent characters mm -hmm. simultaneously I love that sense of, of multitasking, and it's a challenge that you don't see in a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's been really fun, just mechanically. And the storyline is extremely stereotypical anime. If you like it, fantastic. If you want to make fun of it, you will actually enjoy it that much more, I think, because of how ridiculously stereotypical it is. I was going to say, it kind of looks like a weave game to me. It's a great weave game. What wow. are you talking about? 
Wow. Okay. They they literally have a mascot at the police station who at one point in the game follows you around to every single room letting you know what's going on in this room. Like, who's this stalker? <laughs> um little little things like that that are just very, very Japan. And mm -hmm. it's fun to to muse about that. The storyline is yeah, it's it's like your standard 13 episode. Like, go for it, enjoy it. It's kind of like going to a kaiju movie. You know it's not going to be good story, but you're going to enjoy it because of the tropes. Well, yeah, I suppose I see what you're saying. Yeah, I, I, I'm picking up what you're putting down. Okay. Yeah. Um, almost done with the game. Got a couple of chapters left, and then after that, it'll be kind of perfecting my skill set in the game. Okay. There's something to be said for a game that can challenge you skill-wise. So I, I think that part's fun, and I will absolutely skip all of the cutscenes after the original playthrough. Okay. Um, let's see, what else? On PC, I've been playing a lot of Slay the Spire lately. I realized recently that I'm sitting at like 350 hours in the game, and I don't know when that happened, but it happened. Mm -hmm. There's a, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you for some advice later on for Slay the Spire because I'm trying to get into it, and I played a little bit of it here and there, but I mm -hmm. definitely need some like, maybe I should just put in my title when I stream it just be like backseat me fam, because <laughs> I don't <laughs> oh know. <my> like... <laughs> there's there's a lot to get to know in Slay the Spire, and every time that they make a balance change, it does change a lot of how the game is played. Because there are so many difficult decisions that are just like split changes in a moment that branch mm -hmm. out into big changes later on. Mm -hmm. They recently put into beta a fourth character called the Watcher, which is super cool. Her special ability is she has like different stances that she takes, and those stances give her either extra energy or increase her damage or increase your damage, but also increase the damage that you take. So it's very high risk, high reward. Mm -hmm. And it requires a lot of control as to like what cards you have in your hand. It's it's definitely a more advanced play design versus the other three characters that they have. I think they've done a great job introducing people in time. And it's also really fun to see a new class be put into the beta mm -hmm. because you get to explore how the developers are kind of changing the cards up to, to fit the design. Oh, hey, people are constantly using this one card to utilize this one loop that'll basically win them every single match going forward. We're going to have to completely rework that. Or maybe we're just going to nerf it a little bit. Or maybe we'll exchange the other card that it's related to or the relic and change it so that it doesn't do what it was doing before. Um, so a lot of... A lot of fun kind of getting into the heads of the people who are making the game and considering that as well. But Slay the Spire, absolutely fantastic. I will continue to give it rave reviews. And I hear that there are a couple of uh, 2019 awards um, that are asking for nominations now. And Slay the Spire is on a surprisingly large number of them. I was I was shocked by that, especially for an indie game. Hmm. Yeah, I, I bought it on the... Um, on Steam, and then I, oops, sorry, and I also bought it on the Switch when it came out on the Switch because uh, I was like, man, you know, it'd be really good if I could just like lay in bed and just like as soon as I wake up play a game. And uh, I've been like, oh, maybe I should go lay down and like play a game. And then the problem is that I, I, I lay down and I'm just so tired that I can't play any Switch game. I just want to go to sleep. But, but yeah, it's it's a it's a lot of fun. I've played about 15 hours of it on Steam, probably maybe like an hour or two on, on the Switch. Mm -hmm. So I definitely need some, I need some backseating. <laughs> it is a perfect game for portable, but I can definitely understand, especially like getting to know the game, having somebody help you and guide you because there's just so mm. much to it. I'm well, so I mean, surprised that they don't have it on like iOS or on Android though. That's a yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure that's coming. I'm sure it's coming. Yeah, give it time. I'm sure it'll show up uh, there, no doubt. Yeah. So just just to touch on that subject is a uh, um, streaming has kind of ruined video games for me in that when I play a game on my own, it's not the same. I feel like I'm missing out on like an experience with people. You know, like I'll be playing and then something crazy happens and it's just me. No one else got to see it and it feels 
or I have a question and like I have to go Google it instead of just throw the question out to the chat and yeah. experience stuff. Yeah. It sucks without it sucks without chat, I have to say. Uh, at <laughs> times I get that feeling and when we get to me I'll explain why, but yeah. Oh you said it though, Hippo. You you said it. Absolutely. Well I don't mean to take you away from that. That's that those are the most important games. And there was some other stuff that was done on the web, but that's Come that's on. the biggest success. Share it. Share it. Yeah. I'm Fine. good. I am I, I will hold the rest for another fantastic time. Okay. Can I finish what I was trying to say before? Yeah. Okay. So for the record, I know Killzone doesn't sell that great. I know it's not the hugest thing ever, but the thing is, Killzone Shadowfall has ironically become one of the most relevant games Be com by complete accident. This little game from 2014 that was just trying to be a Cold War thriller is about a divided nation with extremists trying to drive people to military action, a giant wall cutting off refugees, and people being deported against their will, and about how division and a cycle of hatred constantly tears us down and keeps us from moving forward as a society. It says all of these things, and it's a game from 2014. Like, it is remarkably forward-thinking once you get past a fairly cliche and awkward introduction. Like, seriously, I think what just did this game a disservice is that the first few hours were easily the weakest. As soon as you get to an embassy being bombed and everything from that point onward, it's actually really clever storytelling. It offers something distinct. And unlike a lot of the other Sony exclusives, it kind of feels a little bit daring. It feels like it's not just going for what's comfortable. In fact, there's some stuff I don't want to spoil towards the end that realistically if this were any like traditional multi-platform military shooter i don't think they would have gone with the ending that they did the ending that they went with was in my opinion extremely risky for what it leaves for if they ever go back to the franchise because the thing is the gameplay potential for if they take the stuff they did with horizon zero dawn and apply that to a new kill zone from that perspective instead of from the perspective we've been playing the last few games for mm -hmm. It could be amazing, because the thing is, the Killzone series has actually been low-key one of the most subversive first-person shooters in a while. It's long-term been essentially a commentary about how things went with World War I, World War II, and also about how political agendas tend to wipe out what's actually happening behind the scenes and how hate allows for manipulators to take control on both sides. It's been their main thrust of the series from the beginning, which... Is extra compelling, and probably why it's so strong is because it's made by an Eastern European team, so there you go. It's, it's very familiar <laughs> subject matter for them, but, like, yeah, it's exploring stuff that you typically would only see, you like to see in, like, Wolfenstein, but it's even doing it with this sort of 80s sheen, which, ironically, Wolfenstein kind of sucked at with the Youngblood, which, yeah, by the way, Wolfenstein Youngblood frickin' sucks. I'm just gonna say that right now. It was really rough, That's and I fired. really did not enjoy it. And I say that as someone who recommends the New Order to basically every human being on the planet. It was, I do not know what happened there. I don't know, but no. But uh, yeah, Killzone Shadowfall. I'm not going to say everyone's going to love it, but I'm going to say if you see it for like five bucks, it's got a smarter storytelling going on than you would actually expect. So um, yeah. So that was the neat find so far for um, the PS4. I will say I'm also very excited to try down Bound, which is, um, I don't know how to describe it. It's like, what if Ballerina, MC uh, Ballerina was, you know, fighting weird abstract monsters in an MC Escher painting set to music and literally the entire world flutters and has a heartbeat based on your movement. So very excited to try that. But um, that, that wraps it up for me. Okay. Yep. So. Hey, Mish. Yeah. What were you doing? Well. <laughs> <laughs> like just now, or. <laughs> right. Uh, gosh. So where do we start? Yeah. So, uh, things were a little weird because of TwitchCon and then staying down in um, San Diego for next week to visit family. But it means I had to get creative as far as some of the games I was playing. I had my Switch with me, thankfully. Uh, so I picked up uh 
Pokemon Let's Go Eevee again and made it. I realized that I managed to skip over three gyms. I didn't realize how I managed to skip over three gyms, but I realized I skipped over three gyms. And after I went back and actually beat those gyms, like, oh, progression makes a lot more sense again. <laughs> how did you manage that? I have no idea. They, like, lock, they lock areas. I don't know, but I did it. You apparently a... managed to just, you know, do complete region breaks. Look, <laughs> if I'm if if it's possible to break a game, I'm pretty damn good at breaking a game. I'm, we saw that with Observer last year for the Halloween stream too. I'm good at breaking games that it's like, how did you? What? How? Miss Michelle Jean. Miss Michelle Jean. Yeah. The speedrunners in the audience would like to speak with you. After yeah. <laughs> right. Except. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I suppose as far as trying to get to the, the Elite Four, that would be a thing that they'd want to know about. How did you get there so fast? Yeah. So uh, I, I was doing that. Um, the other thing I was playing a lot of is, uh, I believe in a previous episode, we we're talking about the Switch and some of the games that were in the NES uh, software launcher and how the games in there, there's a couple good ones, but there's just absolute garbage in there. Uh, I discovered there's an SNES launcher that has a lot of titles in it and there's a lot of good ones in there and uh i went back and replayed super mario world again because i could and that was a you lot know, of fun when this is actually something here, i'm posting it in chat i'm trying to post like all of the things that we're talking about in the chat so if you're listening it's there you guys um but during twitchcon that is also something that sammy brought to my attention that i had no idea was even in the switch um in the switch uh, store at all i had no yep. idea no there was I, no I announcement to play any because i played a little bit of untitled goose game while i was sitting in the hotel <laughs> and uh, yeah no for, but, like the first the first like two minutes of the game i realized that, that game was for me <laughs> i was like okay i have to i have to i have to not play this right now oh god well and the, you know the thing is is like there was no i didn't hear an, an announcement about that i completely missed how like where did that i didn't hear it either about? Uh, mm -hmm. I I was just like, what software that came out that uh, that was free? Like, you know, YouTube is a free piece of software that you download, or Hulu that's a free. I, I was just curious if anything else had launched, and I saw the SNES one. I'm like, well, where the hell was this announcement? I'm like, well, I might as well download it because why not? And yeah, yeah. a lot of great games there. Sorry for not bringing it up because I internally was actually just kind of pissed that half of those games were on the SNES Classic that I spent, you know, sixty bucks on. Uh, what was it? A year and a half ago. Yep. Yep. Uh, Nintendo. But uh, yeah, no. So I've I've I, play, I went back and played a little bit of that on my Switch. Uh, the other thing I played a bit of is uh Magic: The Gathering Arena, because it finally came out of beta, uh, right at the end of t TwitchCon. So I I played a quite a bit of uh Arena. And that was actually the, the some of the, the gripes that I had with Arena, they they fixed. Uh, there's only one thing that's missing. I, they still don't have a friends list. If they can add that, I, I think it would be a, a solid game all the way around. And even even without it, it's still good. It flows well now. Is is it on a launcher or? You, uh, no, there's a. There's I've never a played it myself. It's a it's a free to play game, right? It works a lot like Hearthstone, but it's Magic the Gathering. Um, but mm -hmm. it works really well. Uh, it plays better. One of the big gripes I had with it was when the beta launched last winter, is that the, the different phases in the turn, uh, if there was any type of um, interrupt that could be done to it or uh, anything that could be uh, r resolved, th there was a pause, and it, it didn't always let you know there was a pause. It's so, like, you're sitting there going, why is my turn not progressing? And there was no reason for it. Uh, since then, that's been resolved. If there's a something needs to be resolved it actually pops up and informs you that yeah, there's this card that was played can be resolved what do you want to do etc cetera, etc cetera. uh with that in place uh, it flows a lot better it's a, it was a lot of fun i had a lot of fun playing magic together and then there's a progression system as far as being able to unlock more cards and buy uh, packs and everything else i truly enjoyed it i think i think if i'm going to go back to another card game aside from slay the spire it would be gwent well sure yeah i could see that i kind of love gwent a lot I uh, I, I guess I'm biased to Magic because I've been playing it since Ice Age was a thing. Um, and for those that don't yeah, know, see, I I don't I don't know I don't play Magic. I, I've never played Magic. The, the Ice Age expansion came out in uh, 1995. Mm -hmm. So I've been playing for a while. Um, if Crafty told you how many cards I had, oof, 
um i was going back to my collection i'm like oh how much is this is a nice card up right i wonder how much this one is worth now oh it's four hundred dollars okay nice i'll just put that in a hard plastic sleeve and put it right back and this is why i will never get into magic because <laughs> i don't i am not made of money i am not made of money i pulled it i pulled the card it was in a pack <laughs> so but yeah so as far as like uh games arena was great of course, a certain Space Corgi was trying to get me to play the actual card game with him. I never got a chance. It was a bummer. I really wanted to do that. I'm I'm actually really bummed that I didn't get to meet him at TwitchCon. Oh, you, oh, you didn't? He was he was one of the other people that um, I was uh, I walked up to ESP because I saw her on day zero. So on Friday, I walked up to her. And I'm like, hey, how's it going? And it, no sooner did I say hey, all of a sudden it's like Michelle, and all of a sudden. <laughs> Bam! A good uh, uh, hug. I'm like, oh, high grades. How's it going? <laughs> of all the people that I didn't get to meet, Will is by far like the one that got away. Will, if you're listening, buddy, <laughs> you're the one that got away. I'll be sure to. I'll. I'll. We'll just. Uh, you know what? I'll just go back and just be like, yep, marked it. We'll just uh, let him know about that later. <laughs> Uh, but it, it was it, that was great. Um, I totally bombed in on one of his streams too that he was doing at TwitchCon, and he's like, "Just sit down." I'm like, "Your stream?" He's like, "Yeah, sit down." I'm like, "Okay." The, <laughs> but uh, that's funny because they were like really protective of the streamer booths. Um, I know somebody who was broadcasting, and their very good friend like opened the door and was like, "Hey!" And then like a security guard was like, "Out, out, 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 out!" <laughs> like was, uh, right away. It wasn't one of the booths, though. It was like kind of an open space area towards back towards one of the boot oh, okay. courts. So it's really easy because, okay. you know, I I forget what it was. There was something that happened that made us just kind of troll him quick. And that's when he was like, you yeah, know, sit down. I'm like, okay. So, <laughs> um, so, yeah, TwitchCon was a thing and meeting all the people there. Uh, I was like, what other games have I been playing? Guild Wars 2 had the new prologue for the new season come out. I need to go back and actually play a little bit more of that. I did some of the other stuff. And, uh, some of the changes and whatnot is really nice. I really like that uh, if you buy Path of Fire now, the one expansion, the other one actually comes included free, uh, Heart of Thorns. So you get both expansions now with the purchase, so you're not divided. Mm -hmm. um, and for those that bought Heart of Thorns, they actually gave you um, some in-game additional items, like a shirt, some other things too. So they're, they're just like, you didn't throw your money away. You had that experience, but here's a little extra something for helping support it when it was new, which was really appreciated. <clears throat> um that and uh the rp well i so, <laughs> so yesterday uh i was late to dungeons and dragons because i was in an rp so i I, I was late for an rp because i was doing rp I did. this Ooh. is the role i heard you like problem <laughs> this is the role play yeah and the only reason i was doing my rp is because crafty had an rp going in the living room back behind the blue screen too much. Yep. It's too much. Uh, I, I, I will go ahead and do the shout out here. Uh, for the the crew RP and uh, the event team that that was part of the administration group that that put yesterday's event together. Uh, holy shit, guys, that was incredible. Uh, so for for those of us that are doing the GTA RP with the crew, uh, they're they're migrating servers. Um, and the framework was changing. But to do that, uh, they had to have some type of event. And uh, we ended up with an alien invasion. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where... I, I saw him in chat earlier. There was Hot Fingers that was in chat earlier. I was going to be like, it was, it was really incredibly satisfying to run him over with my SWAT van. Um, <laughs> I, uh, so what ended up happening was uh, we saw these UFOs. They've been appearing for the last couple of weeks. And it's just like, God damn it, they're back again, you know, type of thing. And then all the NPCs suddenly started disappearing. And the sky started changing colors. I'm like, um, this can't be good. And then uh, one of the UFOs, they, they started taking out blimps. So this is the first time they actually started doing anything like that. Uh, they used, uh, like, an abduction. Like, they started, right, pick, they picked someone up off the ground and picked them up, like, 100 feet into the air and then dropped them. <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> but then they started firing onto like 
the hospital, the police station, and everything else. Uh, they had this, like, you know, when you get the emergency services, like, beep, and then you get a message that comes across? They had that loaded into the event. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the city of Los Santos has issued an evacuation a warning, and then uh, those of us that were emergency service characters, we had to get <clears throat> all the other civ uh, civilians to an evac point where there were military helicopters flying in and evacuating citizens out to the military base. And, uh, yeah, that was, it was just, the whole thing was about a two, two and a half hour event, but it was insane. It was insane, but so much fun to watch. Now, Hippo, to your point, you were talking earlier about how uh, ruining, it, it, not streaming a game can kind of ruin it sometimes, because you, you had that, I wish I could have streamed that because just the reactions were just like, oh my, and there's no one I could be like, look at this guys, you know, I was, my characters kept on, my character kept popping up on other people's streams that were going, but we didn't have uh, this community here, or uh, the, the crew, the, the GD crew here, like watching and going, holy, you know, sh whatever to whatever was going on. And like I was on, a, I was a frontline officer, so I was sitting there firing at any aliens. I was one of the cops that grabbed a SWAT van. I'm one of the uh, cops that saw an alien actually on the ground, and like, oh, I'm gonna hit this son of a bitch and run him over, you know? Which was incredibly <laughs> satisfying to watch that because you heard the thunk, which means you know you got him. <laughs> and it's one of the few times you got to do that in an RP situation because you can't just randomly deathmatch people, but. Hell, if aliens are invading and that's what's going on, you get, you absolutely get to do it. So, I had a great time. It was awesome. I won't forget that that event. Hmm. So, I guess we now officially have two games for Battle for Los Angeles, and the best one wasn't even <laughs> official. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. No, it was really good. The event team did a great job because they were trying to decide how they wanted to to transition people to a new server because there's all new uh, mechanics and everything else because there's new uh, framework for the uh, RP. Um, and one of the event team members is like, what about an alien evasion? And they just ran with it and it did a great job. <laughs> well, actually, I have a question and you may not be able to answer this. Sure. Um, but as we all know, the Red Dead Redemption uh, 2 game is going to be ported to PC in about a month. Yep. And I know that there's already some people talking about doing uh, RDR2 uh, RP. like role-playing servers. Yep. Do you know if they're going to be doing that? So here's I would I assume. It's like the only thing that makes sense to me right. for that whole crew. So here's what I know. Um, so the guys behind 5M, which is the uh, launcher and uh, where basically we connect to our GTA server, uh, they're making... Uh, launcher called Red M, which is exactly the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So you could do Red Dead Redemption role play mm -hmm. if you wanted to. Um, there were some people in the crew RP that were talking about doing that. Um, <clears throat> some of us are. There's a few, a couple of us that are, aren't as interested. Like I'd rather just keep playing Gene. I I love playing Gene so much. I do. I, I. No interest in playing Cletus. No, I mean. <sighs> It just wasn't a thing. And I, uh, I think I had more fun watching Hippo play the game last year than uh, my desire to play it. His, his ability to maneuver horses was second to none. <laughs> um, but there were people... Oh, I, that, think, yeah. I think it's the inability to maneuver horses <laughs> is what you're trying to say. Um, same difference, right? You don't forget it. It takes a certain set of skills. Graceful, right. like a swan into a glass door. <laughs> uh, but there were or people, a tree. There were definitely people that were talking about it. Um, there, there's that talk, and then the other thing I've heard talk about was um, this is the kind of someone that kind of broke their their NDA. So, oops. But Sea of Thieves and private servers with Sea of Thieves is apparently the thing. Interesting. So no PvP Sea of Thieves? Uh, I don't know the details to that. Just private servers. Mm. 
someone said something and it was like, oops. And it's like, well, I'm not bound by that same agreement. So here we are. Yeah. So I really wanted to love Sea of Thieves and I love the atmosphere and the the ocean mechanics and mm-hmm. like manning a ship and stuff. I love that aspect of it, but mm-hmm. I'm not a PvP guy. Mm-hmm. And I don't really appreciate the way the the mechanics of dying and respawning are. Mm-hmm. And it's not the it's not the worst in the world or anything, but it's just not my thing. Mm-hmm. So I've been like kind of like, well, I want to get the game and I want to play it, but I also don't really care. I've I played it before, um, with uh, Xbox Insider, I don't know. and I, I I enjoyed it a little bit, but I like I said, I'm not really a PvP guy. Sure. Well, I think that it- said. Skull and Bones, my dudes. Skull and Bones looks really good. Yeah, that's that's the one I'm kind of waiting for, honestly. And the way that's, that's what I'm waiting for, yeah. too. Um, I can't wait to see how it destroys my computer. <laughs> right? Jesus. Which, uh, you know, uh, with that, it's everything I've been playing. It's funny that you mentioned that, because when we get back from the break, that's kind of the first thing we're going to dive into, I think. Uh, but we've been at this for a little bit already, so let's go ahead and take a break. So this is your chance to get up, stretch, go to the bathroom, get a chance to look away from the monitors, and uh, make sure your eyes aren't strained too much. And when we get back, we'll continue our discussions. See you all after a bit. Get one of those blue light filters. I hear that helps the eyes. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Noobcast podcast. Yes. Well, yes. this time in HD. It is. In high resolution 4K. So Wasn't I, it already kind of HD to begin with? Now I mean, it's not, not that like HK. Discord not that a Discord allows for that, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally not wearing my Discord shirt right now. No. Um I'm, it's not really critical that you need HD capture for this. For, for Discord, but yeah. No. Uh, I I have to tell you about a theory later. Uh, but before the break, oh, uh, okay, you were talking about a game uh that could melt your computer, right? If you recall, yes, yeah. Most mm-hmm. most games that come out nowadays will melt computers. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, what about a game that's expected to come out this fall that uh takes up a hundred and seventy five gigs? Well, wait, wait, wait I can a tell you, I can tell you this that I will not be playing that game, so mm-hmm. it won't take any of my storage. Right. But Does go that, on. Is that with the ray tracing option enabled? Is that is that with all of the extra features? That's with all the DLC. That is seriously been the excuse given is that oh, that's just for when you have every piece of downloadable content. But it's like, and this is the game where people always go for all the downloadable content. So um. Yeah. Yeah. Just to make this clear, that would not fit on the original PS4. No. No. No, it would not. No. Nope. That is actually bigger than Red Dead Redemption 2. And this, kids, is why we need to stop pushing for fidelity in games because most of that is just textures. Yep. Which, yeah, Red Dead took up, what, about 150 gigs. So the recommended specifications, the game that we're talking about is uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, the newest one that's coming out. And it's talking about recommended spec- uh, specs, which include having either a, a GTX 970 um, or a Radeon R390 or RX 580, which those, I mean, they're middle line cards at this point, the 900 series, I would argue. But they were high end at one time in their life. To be fair, Call of Duty's kind of been going on a downgrade spree for a while now. I mean, mm-hmm. Some of the, again, the engine that they were originally using for the past two years was still based on OG Quake. Right. They just licensed it out way, way <laughs> back when. So it's tended to be a series that ports well enough. I mean, it was even the infamous thing where Call of Duty Ghosts could actually run on Windows XP. They just literally blocked it unless you used a workaround. Right, well... but. Some of this, like, the card itself isn't that bad, right? Uh, memory's 12 gigs that is recommended. Um, assuming that's DDR4, which that should be pretty easy for any system to come by, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And an i5-2500, which, again, or even a Ryzen R5. Those, those are pretty easy specs, but then you look at the storage, 175 gigs. Yeah. That is... This, this is just a trend. This has been a mm. trend for many, many years now. Mm-hmm. Like, a, like probably five or six 
things keep games keep getting bigger and bigger mm-hmm. and these downloads keep getting worse and worse and i mean nowadays it's not that big of a deal that like i mean it's a big deal in that it's a hell of a lot of space for a game but also i mean memory or like storage is pretty cheap but also why is it almost 200 gigs yeah well, that, that's Here's the a... question yeah mm. when it... the average hard drive is two terabytes you're saying 10 percent of my computer is going to be dedicated to this the argument is going to be made, and is the one thing that Activision has actually been trying to do to curb this, is that you can modularly install. That's apparently something that is just going to become mainstream with the PS5 and the Xbox Scarlet, is that you can be like, I just want the campaign in co-op, or I just want the competitive multiplayer. But even then, just one chunk of that is three times the amount it took for a single portion of Call of Duty Black Ops 3 when it was modular, and it came out on the same damn systems and still looks ridiculously good. Right. It's uh, it's the level of... Well, I feel like it's one of the things that's is critiqued. It's, it's, it's the texture quality, right? Um... Well, the thing is, and the, uh, Raimi Ismaili did a really great breakdown of this, and I want to just include that real quick. Sure. Is, um, you know, people are wondering, well, why is it just the texture? But the thing is, People will complain about the smallest things. If mm-hmm. a single texture clips, if a newspaper is loading for four seconds rather than instantaneous, all of these sorts of things take up disks. We get disk space. <laughs> a disk they, they space. Disk space. My virgin ears. <laughs> <laughs> take up disk space, and also. And then this is very critical. They tend to have to have redundant files for optimized loading because your loading process can only be so fast. But if you have the same file somewhere else, then it can make a faster call and um, you can just whip it out faster. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that is a serious oh, no. issue. It's like, believe it or what not. what we've devolved into. All of those loading screens that you use to complain about with your games, yeah, there's a reason that they exist because otherwise, like, new record. Remember, Batman Arkham Knight was broken, like, broken over, and most of that was due to them trying to ensure that there was never a loading screen except for initial startup. So, with Call of Duty, they're trying to get a level of fidelity that is pushing into the next generation of consoles. And also, they wanted to load faster than stuff that was way lower detail before now. It's just, it's become maddening. And especially on PC, because you have to include all the different layers of detail. Because, like, <laughs> here's what you're playing on lowest detail. Here's medium. Here's ultra. <laughs> so even if you're not playing at ultra, even if you're never dreaming of it, you still have to have that installed. Which, I uh, personally, I think that should be modular. Like, realistically, let mm-hmm. me just install the game at lowest graphic settings. Then if it runs well, okay. I'll, maybe I'll download something a little bit higher, but goodness me. It's just, it's basically a race to the bottom because people keep demanding it, but the cost has to come somewhere. Well, couldn't you argue, though, that that is a, a vocal minority that keeps doing that and it's what's driving into issues where the developers feel they have to do this because I, I would argue... no actually it's not about a vocal minority thing they did an analysis of game reviews and when it came back as i recall correctly it was like 60 percent of reviews typically it's like the visuals or the aesthetics are where are mentioned first okay it's actually a thing that's focused on way more than mechanics or story or anything else it comes down to the fidelity that's why you have a lot of console exclusives too because those games are built specifically to show off. Look at how gorgeous. Are. Why do you think Uncharted exists? It's not to be a deep adventure game. It's to be as visually gorgeous as possible. To be like, look at these giant vistas that we can render on our system. This is something you can only experience here. It's like you're really there. It's like you're interacting with real people. It's used as a selling point. It's been used since ages. That's why we even had live action trailers for a while there. It's sure. an unfortunate an unfortunate problem with the perception of the visuals being better, meaning the game is better, rather than it's just prettier. Well, couldn't you argue, though, that it doesn't always have to require that? I mean, Untitled Goose Game, for instance, has been pretty popular, too, and that's not exactly a very intensive game as far as graphics is concerned. Oh, it's not intensive, Mm -hmm. but it has a very winning aesthetic. 
you yeah. also can't deny that it has a very and that is gone there is that it's selling that plus <laughs> untitled goose game isn't trying to push hundreds of millions of sales no. Call of Duty is going for the biggest chunk of the market it can swallow. Untitled Goose Game is an indie game where if it sold around 250,000 copies, they'd be fantastic. And that also factors into everything because there's more money going in and there's more money expected. It's why Black Ops 4 selling like, you know, I forget, it was like 50 million different copies on a single day was apparently low performance in Activision's eyes. Yeah, Activision mm. does... Yeah, their their sales numbers and what they expect. I mean, they're just as skewed on that as Squeenix is, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, no arguments there, but it's <laughs> what's going into a lot of the thought process of to emphasizing graphics or everything else. It's not that developers want to do that. Goodness me, especially in response on social media, where you see a lot of developers and they're like, "Yeah, yeah, I love to make my games take forever for players to download and for them to then complain about there still being, you know, a slow loading newspaper." It's just, it's like. No one is enjoying this from what everything I've been able to find. No one is happy here. And the easiest solution is that we just chill the hell out about graphic fidelity. So here's the dilemma that I think we get into. And I think Call of Duty is a fan example. How many Call of Duty Modern Warfares do we have? A lot is the answer. You're, you're asking me, but like, I and, literally don't know the answer. Yeah. So, what, why is it that we literally games? don't know the answer at this point? Is that we get to the point where it's irrelevant, other than do I have the newest thing or do I not? Well, sure. I and mean, so, the same. It's the same thing with Madden, right? Or NBA, or and, and any of the sports games. It's an annual installment to an, a franchise. So, so they're trying to make it relevant, and and especially like in NBA, at least you can be like, oh, I've got different players, different rosters, different examples of of how people would perform that makes it interesting and different every time that I come in for it. And that's worth getting the game, even if there isn't anything else that's different on it. Like I can, I can see that. <clears throat> Pardon me. Can I make it? No, I'm sorry. You are still condemned. I'm, I'm just, it's, it's just, <clears throat> it's hurting me. It's hurting me. Right oh, now. oh goodness. Now, uh, now you are condemned to bloodshot. <laughs> the point is like, Call of Duty doesn't even have that to rest on. The only thing that it can really say is we've got a different storyline for a, a campaign that very few people pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Or it's the newest thing and everybody wants to be on the newest thing so that they can play in the highest competitive level. And what else do you have? Not a lot. You could get yourself very easily into the Counter-Strike mode where this game has been sitting out for billions and billions of years everybody still plays this very specific version and then you don't sell copies so they have to manufacture something that is going to be relevant and interesting and they're the way that they manufacture that is increasing the fidelity yeah well that's, that's... i get how it happens but that doesn't make it good for anyone but oh do no they have and, to and do you're that completely though. right about the arms race thing and also it's worth warning that Ironically, there is a brand new experience apparently coming to it. Um, the Spec Ops mode is apparently supposed to be way more expanded. It's essentially a full cooperative campaign that's going to have bigger levels than Black Ops 3 had. But the thing is, a chunk of that mode is going to be PS4 exclusive for the entire first year the game is coming out. And they've barely advertised it. Like, they've mentioned it in interviews, and it sounds interesting, but they don't actually push it. It's become a really big issue and you're completely right in that they're just not having enough time to do things because like black ops 4 originally was supposed to be having a 2v2 campaign mode yes a player versus player campaign mode but because the game had to get rushed out the door it just didn't happen and now apparently black ops 5 is literally whatever sledgehammer was working on and raven software and they're being slapped together with whatever treyarch can make in multiplayer it's it's becoming a rat race it just seems that a lot of these a lot of these bigger games and stuff that it keep coming out it just seems like every year we hear the same thing of well we didn't have enough time or we didn't have enough time and it's like well did you think about taking the time what? like i know that like ceos don't really care about that they it's get it out the door i don't care but if they actually just took the time 
to make a good game. And that's not to say that um, Call of Duty isn't a good game. It's not for me. But if they took the time to make the thing that they actually wanted to make, don't you think they could blow everything out of the water? Potentially. Sure. So one of the games I was thinking of as you're talking about like that with COD or what, uh, a game that I, it was one of the ones I've got the list, but uh, Rainbow Six Siege. You know, I was I literally googled that to see the the size of Rainbow Six because it's gorgeous. The textures are pretty dang good. Fifty seven, but gigs. also it's it's also very small, like it, it's like very small like levels that load. Right. So it's not it's not as big. But even so, like it still looks really good. Yeah, and the fact that they yeah. have new uh, content that comes out on a regular basis, um, I. I which, by the way, I'm like, oh, I got some money to give you guys. Yeah, I mean, I, I truly enjoyed it. And the fact that, you know, the game itself is 20 bucks, uh, mm -hmm. and then you just pay for the newest content, I thought, I mean, it works. It, why is that not something that's being considered? Because I think uh, that Ubisoft uh, kind of nailed it. And uh, honestly, I almost feel like that they've uh, been underappreciated for what exactly they pulled off with, uh, with Rainbow Six Siege. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did it. Going back and actually playing it and truly getting a, a chance to look at it, they did a fantastic job on it overall. It looks yeah, it's great. one of my most it's, favorite shooters of yeah, all time. Yeah, like it, it's and so good. The features are great. The features are mm -hmm. great in it. The the, the biggest issue the that I have would be like, hey guys, could we get some more like PVE love in this? Because yeah. I I do play PVP, but not as not nearly as much. Mm -hmm. Um. But it's a it's an amazing game. They it's you can tell that there's like a lot of love that went into it. Mm -hmm. um, and for it to be like 60, 70 gigs or what would you say seventy five like the max? Uh with all the content. Yeah, I know the core game was fifty seven, fifty eight. I've only recent mm -hmm. I recently installed it on my laptop, so I I've only seen mm -hmm. the numbers recently. But yeah, it's overall it's about a third of the space that the new COD does. It. Which... Well, but but wait, before we get into, like, you know, yelling at them so hard, Red Dead Redemption 2 is, like, 150 50. gigs. Yes, it is. Like, that, I mean, mm -hmm. it's only 25 gigs less. Yeah. yeah. Like, that is still, like, okay, look, I know that some of you, and I, I want to say some of you out there, you all probably have a very good internet, internet service provider. I'm not one of those people. Unfortunately, I have a terabyte uh, bandwidth limit. If I hit that, then I have to pay, like, 50 bucks for or like i don't know it, it's something ridiculous for 50 or 500 gigs i don't know i don't know I, don't, I generally don't go over it but here's the thing this like the last three months or three three weeks ago sorry words are hard three they weeks are. ago my seven terabytes of storage um got destroyed both of my my storage drives are dead i had to re-download a bunch of stuff and I stream as well. Plus, I watch streams. Plus, I'm I'm like also having three other people use the internet. So, yeah. what is... I can't just I can't download a hundred and seventy five gig game. Are you kidding me? Uh, you actually struck on the other big issue, right? Because digital digital distribution is becoming a larger, larger thing, which means that more people are gonna have to rely on that. If you can't get the discs, then you have to download and. I realize that I am in a minority with the internet connection I have, right? I can talk about what I have, and it's great. I, you know, when I was in San Diego at, at the, the visiting family, I was getting the uh, 10 megabits tops. It, I, I had to run my laptop overnight to get even Siege downloaded and installed. What, what would it be like if it was you're trying to download Red Dead Redemption or COD, or any other title that takes up that much storage. And, well, it, it, and honestly, it reminds me of downloading stuff for your console because we all know that it takes so much longer when we download mm -hmm. stuff on the console. Yeah. So okay. it's like. So, the question I guess I would have is, I would ask, is, um, do the developers even have an option to be able to try to compress that, or is that just? I bet something... you it is compressed. Oh yeah, especially so? if it's the cause whole version that is compressed graphics that is actually the files are going to be compressed down a fair bit usually it goes down by like 10 to 20 gigs when it's on the console versions now with like the xbox one x and stuff like that that's introduced patches that get more mm -hmm. upscaled and um 
Also, I wanted just to answer real quick because I didn't get a chance before. In regards to why don't they just take more time, a single game developer can cost close to $10,000 to $20,000 a week to have working. So with just like five to ten developers with a week-long delay, you're looking at another $100,000 lost. That is why they are very stringent about trying to get stuff out on time because the cost, because unfortunately, the game industry is obsessed with living in the in anywhere near the California region where housing market is just insane. Uh, it's just absurd. There's a reason that a lot of indie developers tend to live out in rural areas because the housing market just strangles them. Like literally the reason pandemic closed was because they were based in California. That is essentially what happened. And also basically what did visceral games in so that is why that is the case because i feel like these like industries like i mean we we have so many companies moving out of country because it's cheaper don't you think that they could at least just move to like a little bit cheaper area like don't you think that that would be more oh, absolutely, beneficial. but the, it would be completely beneficial. There's no question of if it would be beneficial. The fact is, nobody wants to do it because there's additional cost for moving everyone. You have to establish the studio and everything else. You have to ensure that there's equipment and everything else handled. They look at the overhead before they look at the end result, and they focus on that big number instead of what could be the end result down the line. Plus, mm -hmm. there's a lot of sense of community, and there's also a matter of candidates for hiring. There's a yeah. lot, just a lot more people begging for a job in the game industry in California than, say, Pennsylvania or you know, freaking Kentucky. You're not going to see a lot of competition out there. There's a reason that a lot of these studios also tend to have universities based right around there because then they can hire brand new graduates who are willing to take a lower price and will do whatever is necessary to get into the industry. It's actually a really extremely predatory thing that's ironically hurting the industry on a whole and is like I mean, its own system of it. it of itself. We we already see that it it's it's hurting the industry in that every AAA game has been garbage this year. Like <laughs> what what triple A title wasn't a letdown this year? What triple A title was not a flop? I can keep thinking of examples from the double A space that have done well, but that's about oh, it. Oh yeah, no, double A space. Double A games that have been doing markedly everything from, you know, the likes of Generation Zero and like even though I wasn't a huge fan of it, a Plague Tale Innocence did marvelous. And that's something uh... else we're also seeing is that there's an in increase now in European and Canadian developers, and that is because yeah. they are making more subsidies, they are making more reasonable housing agreements, and there's much more money there for the people actually making the experience. So you're likely to see that shift continue. Well, probably. Yeah. I'm surprised, given the amount of work that's necessary to develop these super high-res textures and these environments, that we don't see more U.S. games and U.S. studios like making a decision to not prioritize that and and to go more on you know innovative gameplay mechanics, you know. The things that that make the the core function of the game better. Yeah, this is actually a problem that Racefic talked about on YouTube, which is that unfortunately certain gameplay mechanics and ideas just don't sell well on the box. Like seriously, that is the thing is as much as we like to say otherwise, what's on the box still really influences what people go for. Yeah. And the brand name influences a lot of that too. So like there are people who do push for really interesting gameplay ideas. But those can get ignored. Like, both Mass Effect and Andromeda and Assassin's Creed Unity have some really interesting gameplay loops that people have since done whole essays about, about how actually this was a really creative design decision. But that is not what the internet remembers. What the internet remembers right. is goofy face animation, which brings yeah, us back Yeah, because again. it was rushed. Yeah. Like, if, if you... Well, if you keep making a game that is consistently bad, right? In, in different games, different IPs. Consistently bad because it's not done on time. Don't you think you should do something about that? I mean, you see it time and time and time again. Every, every AAA title has been a buggy mess. Well, yes, and that's why different studios have been trying different things. That's why Activision made Call of Duty games take three years apart. There's an yeah. audit. Thankfully. Yeah, except that still wasn't enough. 
and friggin' Ubisoft has to use 10 different studios from across the globe for Assassin's Creed at yeah. this point just to make ends meet to produce enough content. And then they have to really lean in on the DLC and everything else to make that actually pay off because $60 isn't near enough for what they're actually getting coming in. Yeah, it's I mean, really they, they are tangled up. To issue. be fair, to be fair, Ubisoft threw tons of microtransactions into Assassin's Creed. And they charged like a hundred and twenty for like the deluxe or collector's edition. So we're not just talking sixty dollar games; we're talking hundred and twenty, possibly more, if you buy microtransaction stuff. Not yeah. everyone is going to do that, obviously. That but team exists is because they're hoping for people to pay for that. Because realistically, if inflation had kicked in, we'd be paying close to that for the average sixty dollar game, which no one will do. Right. Exactly, which is why they are having to constantly be working at more and more of a deficit. It's the same sort of thing. We are in this arms race that is just strangling the industry. And realistically speaking, that's why the double A is having to grow more and more as a scene, because it's the only feasible way to keep the industry going. We can't yeah. keep working like we were in the seventh console generation, because... Think about it. Think about how many studios died in the seventh console generation versus the sixth. It, in the sixth console generation with the PS2, the Xbox, the GameCube, we saw so many new visions because it was essentially what AA is now. Whereas 7th Gen, ignore that, 7th Gen <laughs> was just this explosion of demand about what you could do and mm -hmm. the ceiling just kept rising and not mm -hmm. everyone could reach the escape hatch. And now we're having a very similar situation right now with this current generation. I mean, just look at how they took Deus Ex Mankind Divided, split it into two games, and we're still not even sure when part two wait, is going to come out. Wait, which game? Deus Ex Mankind Divided. It was... It, <laughs> not, it was not Deus, Deus Ex? Deus? Deus Ex. Deus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I heard it too, but I was going to fight me. <laughs> <laughs> I will... Fight, you fuckers. There, you can do your sensor beep now. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, so I mean, I have definitely read articles, rec not, not recently, but, like, you know, within a few, like, six, seven months, where people are talking about how there's going to be, like, a game recession because mm -hmm. nobody can keep up with this, mm -hmm. and the only, the only developers that are putting out quality games are, like, indie titles and, like you said, the, like, double and down so it's like triple a is gonna die because they can't keep up with their own promises oh i don't think it's gonna fully gonna ever die but it's just they have to be as safe as possible that's why you end up with all these games that are just made for as massive an appeal as humanly possible that's how you have developers making the division two and then saying it's not political because that's the safest route to take it because they can't take any risk of losing <clears throat> sales because the second you lose sales, very good chance you may have cost hundreds of people their jobs. Yeah. So it's it's everyone is terrified and having a turf war on the deck of the Titanic. Well, it, at the same time, I'm not going to lie, I kind of want to see Ubisoft succeed in what they were doing, though. Because Watch Dogs has taken more than a, that year, like that year cycle, it's taken a couple of years. Same with Assassin's Creed, and because of that, I want to see them succeed. Because oh yeah, it, oh yes, Ubisoft's I, I want that to succeed. I want that so much to succeed to prove that you can actually do that, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. There's one more thing I want to also add, and that is that um, this is actually something I, uh, when talking to Nelson, it's come up several <laughs> times, and um. Everybody likes to complain about how the Hitman 2016 reboot, you know, how episodic it was and everything and how mm -hmm. nobody liked it. But here's an interesting thing. I was hearing about the engagement rate. Mm -hmm. There was like, I don't remember the exact numbers here, so don't quote me on this, but there was a dive into it. And like the difference in engagement was the amount of people who reached the end of Hitman 2016 because of its episodic release schedule was like closer to 60%, which is hmm. exceptionally good. The ideal rate of completion for any single player game is about 40 to 50%. By comparison, Hitman 2 came down to like close to 20% and it was all in one package. So it kind of comes back to the Jim Sterling conversation piece about how we all say we want really rich, deep black coffee, 
but realistically that's not what our behavior says and that's something else that the industry is going to have to grapple with because technically yes episodic gaming can be a pain in the arse but it is there's metrics now to say that there's a chance there that that might ensure that more people play a game fully and also engage with all the content produced and make it more worthwhile so how things evolve how we keep people engaged and keep going with these games that are getting infinitely bigger is going to be kind of fascinating and terrifying would you say that um that developers were so preoccupied as to whether or not they could make these graphics that they didn't consider whether they should In for the next Jurassic Park game. Let's go. You guys ever played Telltale Jurassic Park? I plan to. Should we? No, just don't. Oh, I look. For- oh, now I'm looking for. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't mean to get on a tangent here, but I did play it, and there was oh, one point I where remember. a lady was hit by a car. The dude. So she's laying in the road in mud, face down, and the guy comes out of the car and he's like are you okay <laughs> okay yeah yeah i need to play this. No, <laughs> i no. need to play this the mechanics will make you rip if, your hair out you actually want... elijah if you were to play it i think you'd love it <laughs> this is your game my dude hey perfect perfect because like, you you too could also play this game as you don't have hair to rip out it's already happened what game did you play i i will find a way to rip out my beard hair uh, okay. <laughs> I was say no. If you're gonna play a Jurassic Park game, play the Frontier one. It's it's a lot more fun. Um, or right. you could just play Zoo Tycoon, the original, which had dinosaurs way before you had to have any official branding. So, hey, uh, shifting gears a little bit. It was brought up just a moment ago about uh, the Division Two being political. Uh, yeah. What about what about uh, game publishers that have gone political, whether or not they would like to admit. That they went political. I'm. I got. I left my grandma on fire. Uh, <laughs> <I'm gonna go. laughs> I didn't realize that Elijah was your grandma. I uh, left Elijah on fire. I will be back. <laughs> youngin, I'm gonna whip your ass. <laughs> right. Uh, okay, grandma. So you do that. I I feel like at this point. Uh, everyone realized what happened last weekend there in a Hearthstone tournament with Blitz Chun and uh, the broadcasters and how it was yeah. pulled and he was banned. That made national news, like actual news yeah. news. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so before, let, let's do a disclaimer before we get into this topic. We mm. all know how like hot button topic this this is. We're going to try to stay more objection, objectable. Object. You, know, you know what I mean. Objective, we're not gonna yeah. yeah thank you yeah what what are those words that i don't know currently but <laughs> words are hard, but we're, we're gonna we're, we're gonna just try to like stay pretty well like, so formal distance i would say yeah. like the... formal and and restrained i yeah I, I think one of the things that uh i really su- sums it up really well is um we've talked about the influence on other uh, publishers throughout the even this year uh, recall uh, when we were discussing epic the epic game store one of the issues that came up was how much stake tencent owned in epic right uh they have st- stock in that they have stock in ubisoft I mean, they have stock in and they have stock Blizzard. in discord yeah they own uh riot games yep 100 percent riot games uh, but so in Activision, it, the, hmm. the smallest Other stake, yeah, the smallest stake is Activision of all things. That's, that's the crazy part. Yeah. Oh mm-hmm. well, the, there's a reason for that. After the whole Vivendi issue, Activision's been very leery of anyone else, which is ironic considering they're evil overlords. But I guess you know you hate what you have your own internal problem. Well, no, no, have, have, have you keep yourself at the top? Become... <gasps> no, they survived long enough to become the villains. Oh. All right. Done, so done. <laughs> Okay. Um No, uh I mean, from what we saw, uh of course they backpedaled recently. They they have decided that they're going to 
give the cash reward and to the bliss chan it's right. a big non-apology though oh absolutely. they never say hey we did this wrong um and in fact i think i think the the closest that they ever get to that is a section in their letter towards the very end that they say well what could we have done to do things better i think the big implication there is that what they did and right and I mean, there's a, a lot to be said there. Um, the big piece that I want to bring in to the puzzle is taking a look at other professional environments where you have professionals or where you have people who are competing, players who are competing, and how they handle politics and, and personal opinions and, and things. There's a lot of uh, history there in so many different environments. What about the NBA? Because mm -hmm. right at the same time, that was time, like a week later, right? Yeah, well, it was right or earlier. With yeah, within a few days, within five days of the Blitz Chung thing, was uh was the NBA and uh, the manager of the was it the Houston Rockets? Don't quote me on that. I thought it was Houston. Yeah, I don't. I didn't actually read any of that. I uh, I I totally missed the the NBA thing, and in fact, I missed what happened with Blitz Chung until it exploded. And uh, I think that it's much bigger than just, you know, Blizzard punishing some people over taking the time to, to speak on something that they shouldn't have during an interview. Shouldn't well, have, by the way. Right. Well, because of the, the amount of control that uh, the Chinese government's got and everything that goes into the country and the censorship that goes into it, they're, they're worried about that, that line of money just drying up and being cut off from yeah them. I, I was thinking about that too because i don't think it's just like 10 cent owning five percent of their business i think it's also the the chinese market because yeah. how many people are in china and how many people are gamers there and how many people play their games there if they get completely blackballed from china they're losing yeah. out on mi hundreds of millions of dollars yeah and it's alone yeah well, they make almost as much as the American market, right? And that's yeah, where you want to go with that, like, right? I, I I'm not that's... even like sticking up for Blizz here. I'm just saying, like, on on the grander scheme of things, just business wise, right? Like, they're damned if they do, damned if they don't. And I think mm -hmm. that they handled it in a very poor way, and they yep. doubled down on it. So yeah, with Elijah, what you're going to, you're start, you're starting with internet cafes, right? Because there's so many PCs that are in those cafes, and how many licenses are being, and that's why it's such a huge market. Uh, in, in addition to the privately owned licenses that are going to all the different players, right? Especially because the thing is, it's fairly easy for people to buy multiple licenses of a game. So like that's how you have like hackers in Overwatch from China and everything, because they literally just go over and spend another five dollars and they have a new account already ready to go. They don't have to stop for anything. So there's a lot of money. They ironically are actually probably profiting off of cheaters at this point. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's it's a reason why I stopped playing PUBG, but that's a whole nother thing. Um <laughs> But uh, it's hippo. I think you really nailed it. It's a case of the damned if they do, damned if they don't. Um, because but I mean, like I said, they 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 mishandled they, it. Oh, absolutely. Uh -huh. They they pulled the trigger too fast on it instead of actually seeing how. Uh, because the, do they think that there would have been an, an absolute knee jerk reaction from from being shut out of the game? I don't. I don't, I don't think so. I'm so sure. this is something that I, I talked about and somebody brought up. So I said, you know, they didn't really think about how the American public would see them. And they just kind of made their decision. But somebody brought up the fact that they're an American company yep. and they should know how the American market and the public would perceive this move against somebody who is speaking their mind. Yep. I mean, we've for the longest time which was not very long ago, we um we ha we had like the red scare and all that stuff happening, yeah, and so yeah. that's still in people's minds yeah. in America. It's still there. Yeah. And when you have somebody asking for democracy and needing help mm -hmm. because of like atrocities that are happening, to turn a blind eye to something like that, and the American public seeing you snub people like they did 
it's a horrible thing to especially like older people who live to that generation they're like what this yeah. is why it's national news it's not it's no longer a blizzard and and esports thing it is a democracy versus communist like yeah ordeal here that's mm -hmm. why it's such a big deal right well uh, also i want to point out something that not a lot of people have been bringing up but is actually very relevant and i think part of what influenced blizzard's thinking on this mm -hmm. because there was the question of you know just how instant the reaction would have been from china well um has anyone been able to buy a copy of devotion the latest game from the people who made detention no it has literally not been for sale after a week after release because it was found in the textures that in one of the placeholders textures there was a meme about the president of china being portrayed as winnie the pooh which he apparently <laughs> fucking hates <laughs> and this led to as, the game being as... banned the publisher getting severe infractions the developer from our i'm not sure if the developer even still exists as a development house at this point and they were in taiwan they weren't even well, in like in but that's... On china mm, yeah but, but the thing yeah is, there's a disturbing precedent there of just how swiftly the hammer came down that I could see a company that's way more risk averse, as we just established, Activision Blizzard, very keen on making just the most money possible and not getting anybody's feathers ruffled. I can totally see why they would just jump on being like, nope, nope, this everything's fine. There's nothing to see here. That guy, oh, he's not with us anymore. Oh, because yeah. I mean, they're just terrified. Um, I, I don't have the link in front of me right now, but I know IGN did uh, a post or translated a post from Twitter um, from um, the Chinese Blizzard account regarding the scenario. Yeah. And the this is the translation on it is is definitely more harsh than yep. what we saw here in yep. the US. Um, specifically, it stated that the players involved will be banned. The commentators involved will be immediately terminated from official business. Like, Which they they were. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a CEO turnover that was like the, n they're not going to six months and uh, a payout. I, I think one of the big things that also occurred is uh, how harsh the punishment was. Mm -hmm. I think that that's one of the bigger issues too, right? Like obviously they have to do something to save face to be able to get into that market still, right? That was bound to happen because we understand how how strict that government is. It paid any attention to any political uh news from that part of the world. But they it was a knee jerk reaction. It honestly was and it was to something that was like, holy shit, really? He he said well eight words. <laughs> eight words. Yeah, well and this this non apology or non whatever the what a, the statement that they put out was very uh, condescending and the it was reactionary and insincere and you can yeah. you can just read it and be like oh yeah that's they just they wrote this because they had to yeah because this news was i mean it was it was blowing up Employees and it still is there's literally, yes there is going to be um protests during blizzcon now yeah Oh yeah, absolutely. They, they've really misstepped multiple times here. Yeah, they and... uh, they they did a fantastic of uh stepping in. <laughs> so um, yeah, no, they they didn't do it right at all. Uh, the only thing I can really hope from it is that uh, other publishers at least learned so they can have a uh, oh shit button that they can do that doesn't end up resulting yeah. in the same thing. So. Something interesting here is that they not not only did Blizz misstep twice, but they did it again by saying that they they would be um, punishing those who spoke out. And so here's the thing, right? I get that if you you use your platform in that way, mm -hmm. you get punished, right? And and Blitzchung also understood this. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. he knew it. However. Yeah. The company, uh, Epic Games, said that they would not be doing anything like that. But here's the thing. They're not the ones that are in that public eye right now. So yep. they can just say whatever they want. Yep. But so <laughs> Blizzard, like, doubled, tripled. This thing is, like, ongoing. Blitzchung responded, saying that he, he has no ill will towards Blizzard, understands why they did it, etc., etc. Yep. Wishes nothing but the, blessed, uh, the best for Blizzard. But... The problem is that this is much bigger than them now. 
this is way larger than than Blitzchung playing Hearthstone. Yeah. Like, this is much larger. It's... And I don't know if it's going to be swept under the rug. I mean, mm-hmm. maybe. The public the public uh, attention span is, what, like four, four days? Well, five. what, what uh, I think it does is it puts a light on just how much influence is being done on the, the private sector and the American market and the companies that act within it. What kind yeah. of influence is there? Uh, I mean, it's some people have that realization. It's why, for instance, for myself, I will never ever buy Lenovo. Like I have, I I'll buy it and give a lot of brands chances, and I I'll flat I'll say, look, I'll give you guys a chance and try you out and see if I like it. Um, not Lenovo. Will not get within fifty feet of a Lenovo. Mm-hmm. Will not do it. Um. Yes. I, I- I think for me, it's a matter of how do you navigate these practices? The Olympics has an understanding on it. Individual athletes can make their say. And we treat that in its own realm, right? Like, mm-hmm. imagine the scenario where we say, oh, hey, Liz Chung's um, opinion was his own. He had the opportunity in a voluntary interview that we gave him to make a statement. He made a statement. Yeah. Um, and, and if that was the end of, of where it was at, and and Blizzard just said, hey, this is the environment that people can opt in on when we give them the opportunity to interview. Would we be in the same environment? Because we don't see that in the Olympics. We don't see that in FIFA. And goodness knows, FIFA is super political. I think it Um, comes down to the simple problem of the matter that esports games are just, for one thing, esports is still being so, is so in much in its infancy, but also it's so much more corporate based like sports i have corporations everything don't get me wrong there but the thing is a lot of the games you see being played the olympics and what those have existed for centuries if not longer whereas hearthstone literally came into existence when we were all alive and a lot of the corporations that are running these games are running it at an angle of for profit versus sportsmanship or letting people speak their minds so I'm concerned that that's part of what's going to hold us back a bit is that a lot of these games just they they didn't really seemingly plan for oh shit all the things that happens with sports is going to happen with ours game now. Well, I think it goes even deeper than that, but um I guess the the other observations I observations I have is um you know, about a year ago we watched individuals like Mike Morheim who's one of the founding members of Blizzard, the part. And it seemed un- unprecedented. Like, why are you leaving now? Did he see mm-hmm. some of this already? I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not speculating. I'm just asking. Is this something that he saw and felt he didn't want a part of? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think some of these other companies that, that have that stake in there, uh, what are they going to do? You know, or what's their market look like in China? Uh, and what are their actions going to look like going forward? Really, that's the biggest things I want to know. I feel like we can keep going on this, uh, but we mm-hmm. uh, maybe shift gears a little bit and talk about something a little lighthearted. Maybe that would be nice. Yeah. Um. What? So we we talking a lot about consoles, right? And uh, the next gen consoles are coming up too. We've heard a little bit about PlayStation Five. Um. Let me ask you guys this. With the PlayStation 5 and the, that next gen, what would it take for you to actually buy one? What what would be the selling feature? Does it have to be uh expandable hard drive space or be able to, to switch it out? Is it uh an incredibly oh, high the, frame rate the, uh VR or what? To be clear, expandable and switchable hard drives have been a thing in PlayStation since PlayStation 3, so that's already a guaranteed feature at this point. But you, you're definitely going to need one if they keep on going oh, larger yes. and larger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yes, especially because they're going with an SSD, which just makes me really go, great, so this is going to cost more. It's going to be mm. probably small as the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. I'm expecting, at best, maybe one terabyte if they're actually being at least slightly ahead of the times. But I can see them trying to get away with 750 gigabytes because they're crying out loud. This thing over here was a launch gen PS4, and despite having technically 500 gigs, it only actually has 400. 
Sure. OS. Hmm. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, is okay if I go first? Sure. Um, for me, PS Five. One of the definite things that they need to do is actually make it be more open ended to the community and everything else. Because thing, Xbox and Switch are getting along beautifully and xbox and pc <laughs> also getting along beautifully so mm -hmm. it's like okay sony you finally knuckled down now let's see you actually make it work for us because at the end of the day one of the things that's always helped sell consoles is being able to play with friends and whatever and you know that sony's been really dropping the ball on that both in not really supporting that many online games that aren't mmos but also just in general it's been this really stiff aversion to that so i would advise that um also obviously make a user interface that doesn't make my head hurt <laughs> that would be beautiful like uh -huh. at this point going back to playstation 3 would actually be an improvement over what they have got right now so let, let's go for something a little less art house and a little more it just works sure um Maybe just, you know, bundle a headset because, my gosh, I can't believe that publishers can't have, of these platforms can't figure out whether or not to bundle in a headset. And obviously just tossing in a free $10 headset is just something you should do. But it would be 50 extra dollars. You know yeah. that, right? Yeah. Oh, I know. Because uh, these things cost like $17 to make. They cost I... like $17. Oh, yeah, yeah. Could I? They're like $60 to buy. Let me Let me just throw in a... Uh, an option too as a possibility and it would probably actually be I, I realize they probably wouldn't be able to license it out but what if they just allowed you to sync your own bluetooth headset that would be marvelous wouldn't it that would be a really great thing that basically right? any console should do at this point yeah, right it should or, or but... a phone app for crying out loud i think microsoft has finally added that for the xbox that you can talk to someone over the phone i mean nintendo switch does it yeah so yep. it's like it's not is actually rocket surgery which here, is people. crazy considering uh, microsoft had a phone app for xbox since the 360 i had 360 smart glass for a long time because it was on uh this uh you and i both know this it was on on windows mobile that that take you back a little bit mm. <laughs> uh but was it was it windows on... mobile or windows phone i thought it was windows phone it was it windows phone I, it was, I, I don't think it was that far back. I've 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 used both. I've used both operating <laughs> systems. To be fair, um, oh my gosh, do you have an Atari sitting at home too? While we're at it, uh, I have a Coleco back at my mother's place. I mean, there's that bonus. Yeah, <sighs> and I think I think my um my Windows like Palm Pilot version OS phone is somewhere around here too. Um, anyway. Um, final thing I want to say is, and this was a major selling point for me with the PlayStation 3, is I know there's people who really love, like, Bloodborne or whatever for the PS4, and that's great and everything, but what originally got me to consider the Xbox at the time, before they canceled half of them, a lot of the games they had announced for it were really exciting for me, whereas with the PS4... This stack maybe gets twice as high. That's about all the really notable exclusives I can mention that I want to play. That's about it. There are actually less games on the PS4 that have me going ooh excite than there are on the Wii U. That concerns me. And like, but Nintendo I'm does so talking... well with those exclusives. Come on now. <laughs> It just, I would really like to see them actually show some of that creative flair again because, like, stuff like Puppeteer exists and keeps my PS3 plugged in in 2019. Whereas yeah. the PS4, it's just sort of like, I look forward to playing these, but a lot of them are very one and done experiences. They're that is the one thing that concerns me, especially about the PlayStation versus the Xbox models. That Xbox has been investing a lot more in the good kind of games as service where they're giving more content, they're giving more reasons to keep playing their games. Whereas Sony, it's just sort of like, yeah, here's Ratchet and Clank. Are we going to make a sequel? Are we going to make expansion? Nah, we're just going to put it back here. It just, it's here. It's just, you know, if you want to play again, it's right here. Like Did to the point that when Brooke... they... Wait, wait, was that a Brooklyn <laughs> accent that I just heard? I, cause it's I have never been able to do it intentionally, but yeah, suddenly out of nowhere, I broke into a... <laughs> That's a... Yeah. So there you go. 
I, I, it was not intentional. I have never been able to do it intentionally. I am so annoyed that I managed to do it completely by accident. But, um, seriously, that is just it. A lot of them, they just kind of treat their games as very disposable. Like, even the ones that are guaranteed to be getting a sequel, like God of War and Spider-Man PS4, they happened, and that's about it. Like, I know there's going to be another Spider-Man on the PS5. That's pretty much guaranteed at this point. I'm sure it will be very charming and suitably, acceptably entertaining, but there's no real it factor. There's no crazy inventive stuff. We haven't really seen anything like Flower or, like I said, with Puppeteer or all sorts of really interesting games. There was such a wide breadth the second Sony wasn't doing well. The second they started doing well, I'm going to say it, they kind of just got laid back and not concerned about really pushing the envelope. Oh, a sure. lot of their exclusives are already available on PC, and oftentimes it was just a timed exclusive and they'd end up on Xbox anyway. Yeah. I mean, that that that's the problem, though, right? Is you, you really hit the nail on the head for me as well, is what exclusive makes me buy the console or what exclusive makes me want to play that game really bad that i just i have to buy it right mm -hmm. now as a as a streamer as a broadcaster on twitch it's my job so i kind of have to buy it anyway to play like games that are interesting to my audience mm -hmm. um that said i would say backwards compatibility is a must Oh, like, yes. I refuse to buy another console if it's not backwards compatible. But thankfully, the, the PS5 is. Um, yep. That, I would I, say... Is, I'm waiting on... I'm curious about that, because how they handle that is going to be interesting. Because, fun fact for everyone, you remember how the PS4 wasn't backwards compatible? Yeah, the mm. jailbroken version with the, uh, the PS4 Linux thing, they found you can actually get a ridiculous number of PlayStation 3 games running at full 60 FPS on the PS4. The hardware completely supported it. They just didn't support it. Sure, so just the emulator mm -hmm. software. Yes, it just it, it yeah. really wasn't that hard to do. So it comes down to if Microsoft's willing to put the money into their own emulators and getting it running smoothly on the Xbox, and the Xbox Scarlet is apparently going to run everything that's currently running on Xbox One, including the backwards stuff. Sony really needs to be like, okay, your PS1 can run on this, your PS2 can run on this, your PS3 and your PS4, because if they do that, they have more generations worth of games. They have some of the most historically relevant games running on their hardware. So yeah, I completely with you there. If they don't go in on that, it's really, really going to be disappointing. I would say, you know what I want to see? And maybe I don't, now that I think about it. And let me put it to you. <laughs> let, me, let me pose this to you guys and, and everyone who's here right now. Um, I would like to see more cross-play. More, more uh, cross-platform play. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I really kind of, like, retracting that a little bit is that I play Dauntless. And I know you Xbox and PlayStation users out there just like to close the app sometimes. You know who you are. You know who you are. <laughs> but there there are definitely times where people just abandon a what they think is a lost cause. And it's really a majority is only console users. I feel like it might be because they're younger or whatever. Hmm. They have less patience. But there's definitely more of a toxic... Um, a toxic encounter with people on Dauntless that are console players. Not not necessarily in that they are um, belligerent or abusive or anything like that, but in that they just leave. Sure. Well, so I think in that, I don't think, I think you're onto something having it there. I, that risk is going to happen, I think, with that. But I think, uh, I mean... You and I both are Elite Dangerous commanders, right? We play a lot of Elite Dangerous. At our I would be going back soon. Yeah, you and I both. Uh, but I would love to have some of the people that pop into the channel that play on Xbox or PlayStation yes. to be able to join mm -hmm. in. I, I think that would be great. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but I, I would love that. Something you do need to consider with people quitting out more readily on a console is also just, for a lot of them, Playing on a console is kind of just, it is a plug-and-play sort of experience, so that's part of the For reason sure. why you're going to oh, see yeah. people quit out more, whereas 
on PC, I have sat down in front of this desk and I am dedicated and I am going to be glued to the screen for the next few hours, which is something that especially a streamer is going to get, but yep. casual players are less likely to think about it. For them, rage... Hi, yes, hello, I'm casual. casual as fuck. <laughs> I don't... The, the only game that I'm more like hardcore than any other game would be RimWorld. But even that, you, you mean, it's not the Rim same, what? you know? Mm-hmm. Rim what? Rim yeah. world? Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I, I want to see more more cross-platform play. It is yeah. damn near 2020. It's about time. Yeah. Hmm. What about you, Disney? That, those are things. Um, you... I'm here here to make ridiculous statements that um that are going to make people upset. All does... right. Hold Does, on, let me hold on. Let me get to unfriend. Oh, hold on. I, all right, go ahead. Be prepared. Be go prepared. Ahead. Okay. Mm-hmm. My um, button is ready. Is the PlayStation Five going to poop out gold? If so, I will consider purchasing it. You're a broadcaster, so the answer to that is kind of. <laughs> You're a little bit, yes. Very. That is really <laughs> the only thing that would keep me going at this point. Until there are at least three exclusive games that I cannot get on my Switch and cannot get on my PC that are of worthy interest, no, absolutely not. You know, I I got my PS4 Pro recently. Um, That purchase was that half-stage upgrade, and I know that there are going to be a variety of games that are also going to be available on PS4 and PS5 over the next few years. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's I'm kind of curious to see how we're going to handle that because... By contrast with Microsoft, the way they're treating the Scarlet, it sounds like it's being treated as another increment like the Xbox One X. So how cross-generational games release now is going to get really interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's there's just, there's no reason at this point. And I don't think that there's any technological benefit that's going to be extremely different from the PS4 Pro to the, to the 5 that's going to make a... a a meaningful decision, you know, like VR you is in, solid. Like, in terms of hardware or like games, because I definitely feel you on the games front, but hardware. I mean, even it doesn't really matter. You, exactly. I mean, you have a point. You have a point. Exactly. Exactly. Will Will there be some hardware improvements that will be meaningful? Yes, but without the games, it's not relevant. And so many of the things that are being developed right now can be functional on a PS4 or PS4 Pro reasonably. So, I mean, if I were willing to dabble a little bit more in VR, I think that would be one front where the hardware would be especially important and especially beneficial. But at this point, eh, there really isn't anything that that's satisfying my needs on there. And maybe this is a Maybe PlayStation's losing me to the Switch and to the PC again. To say that I'm being lost from PS4 to Switch is shocking, but I think a real possibility at this point. Well, I mean, a lot of the games now have made the jump over. Right? We've yeah. reached a point where Alien Isolation is releasing on the Switch. They have figured out how to optimize for that thing. The Witcher 3 is coming to it. Yeah. So long as you're not obsessed with graphics, you're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. And this reinforces the point that graphics are not the important element. Yep. Uh, we, we've we argued that, though, for the longest time. Yeah. Uh, like on podcasts, uh, on so many different things. Graphics, yes, while can really bring something to the table. Like I said, I play RimWorld, which is my main game, and it's not graphically beautiful. And yet, we have such a big community dedicated for that game and yes it is a niche game but there's still a lot of people out there who are like this game it's not even 3d mm-hmm. yeah here's my big challenge to mm-hmm. developers if they want to sell me on a new console because this is something that i was what got me excited for um fable legends of all things because one of the things the game was clearly promising about saying was that elemental effects were finally going to be more than just a graphical thing like you were seeing enemies be frozen and they would actually shatter, or if you set them on fire, the environment around them would be caught on fire. You know, like, environmental gameplay ideas that could just be, like, built in instead of treated as a unique feature for just this game. It would no longer be, look at Far Cry, you can set a field on fire, that's so unique. Instead, it'd be like, no, fire just works like fire! And that's just, can be a mainstream thing in the Unreal Engine! What? Fire? 
Uh, is fi- is this a meme? Is <laughs> <laughs> I just I just saw <laughs> some friggin' environmental effects or some AI use this technology for actually substantive things because yeah i'm completely with the crowd of wanting more new substantive gameplay because that was one of the things that never really got explored again with assassin's creed was like with unity they were trying to make crowd ai that would you know behave dynamically because of the mobs in france during the french revolution this technology seemingly has never come up again in the series but that has a lot of potential because mob psychology allows for some really interesting stuff, especially in a stealth game where you can induce people into a panic. Instead, with Syndicate, it went right back to the crowds will just run away and everyone else will ignore them. These are the sort of things that could get me interested. If you're going to show me that this hardware is being used to make the game smarter, then I'm here. But yeah, I not, think not I think I, I I understand where you're coming from, but from like a a Sony standpoint they're not making the game they're making the platform mm-hmm. and ubisoft is one who needs to be doing that and yep. taking advantage of it yeah, as okay, the developer but sony's also got their own studios same for microsoft of course of course of course i i definitely agree with you i mean i i agree with you i know what you're saying but i'm also saying that there there is that like disc connect where they're making a platform and providing it it's whether the developer is want to oh, utilize those and as the people making the platform they have to sell it the most mm-hmm. you so know that is the big concern i want to put it out there here's my thing uh what i would like to see and would, would at least make me consider it with the games there is mm-hmm. let the uh let the extra features of the system actually be something that other parties use like encourage third parties to use the the console features now an example of this i think uh the 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 system that is the most feature rich as far as like trying to do stuff unique and different is the nintendo systems and this has been true since the wii right but third parties uh developers don't utilize it i want to see i would i would like to see it encouraged so it's not just first party developers that are making things that are like it's move controlled or it's in vr or it's whatever right uh, I I would want to see him encourage it more. You want to mm-hmm. uh try to try to sell it um to be on the console, to have a unique experience on the console. So even if it's not uh, if it's a game that is uh on say PC also, what can they do on the P- on the PlayStation to make it a unique experience? And using the features that the console has would be the way about doing it. Mm-hmm. Now, being a PC Master Race person I am, there's probably a way to do it on PC, so whatever, but... (laughs) Well, that's the thing, right? It's like, I got my PlayStation, and I got my Switch, and I planned on playing them a lot more than I have, because it's like, everything is on on the PC. Like, so much is on the PC. I I was saying in chat that I, like, I bought Octopath, or I bought uh, the Switch for Octopath, and then three months later, it came out on PC. Yeah... Uh, but at the same time, Nintendo is kind of the one that it has the games that are console sellers. They're still the ones that do that best. Like, uh, I know it's further on down our, our list of things to discuss, but the games I'm looking forward to this year is because Nintendo. Um, but that's just, that's just my two thoughts. Ooh. Speaking of games, you guys ready? Do you want to move on, or are we done? With, like, are we done with this I topic? Have one last I, have... thing that I want to say real okay. quick in regards <laughs> to encouraging feature usage. Because here's the thing: like I said, I have games that I'm still actively interested in playing, specifically on the Wii U, just because I love the way that system controls. But um, understand also that um, damn, a certain handheld system that Sony pushed really what i heard required use of certain features and that's actually what hurt it it from getting forth like certain developers will just say no so and uh, i don't know how much more i can say on that but just like yeah sometimes saying you need to support this just means people will just say okay i'm going to do as little as possible or they're not going to do it at all because like 
just look at how ea handled the wii u like there's a lot they could have done with that especially Mm -hmm. in terms of like dead space 3 with the other controller holding the screen they could have had that be the only version that had local co-op because it even had more cpu capacity and instead they just were like yeah we're just not going to release on it so that's also a factor i'm completely in agreement that yes make the gimmicks be worthwhile but um and make them be deeper than gimmicks but uh yeah uh, more often than not i'm gonna be expecting that j- yep i still have the gyroscope and i can use this knife i think she's having you know the, the i think her mental engine is backfiring well I, I think we've gotten to the point where we are beating this into the ground. Oh, yeah. This was the last thing I wanted to say. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, maybe just shifting the thoughts since we're talking about things that we'd love to see. Um, I think one of the things that, and we, especially we were t- discussing this with uh, AAA titles and not really doing anything innovative, and we're seeing a mm-hmm. rise in the AA scene because of it. Um. What's something out of uh, a new IP, just in general, that you'd like to see? Hmm. Well, I'm oblig- obligated to say, for fuck's sake, Ubisoft, bring back Assassin's Creed multiplayer. You know just what? Bring- I'm going to agree with you, actually. Yeah, you know, that, <laughs> I, I actually yep. really like that. Yep. <laughs> it was so good, and they keep swearing that, like, well, no, that wasn't what I re- Yes, but you won awards for crying out loud! This isn't like, you know... This wasn't, you know, like the Dead Space 2 multiplayer where I know people who loved that, but, you know, it's not like it's make or break if Dead Space has competitive multiplayer, whereas Assassin's Creed? It was the reason I own Brotherhood. It's the only reason some people still play Black Flag. Mm -hmm. Bring it back! (laughs) This G, I mean... We were roommates at the time, right? Remember uh, Revelations and the multiplayer sessions in that? Those were long sessions sometimes. (laughs) He's just like, yep, whatever. Fine, fuck it, we're done. (laughs) No, no. Um, I I was just thinking about other, like, I'm, I'm very last minute what what games i'd like to see like swap it the other way around and it's interesting because like there are so many games that have like a good multiplayer version Mm -hmm. and then they have a single player version but it it really is just like a formality more than anything else Mm -hmm. like i I think about like fortnite and how that was supposed to originally be and then becoming super multiplayer yeah. And I I don't think um I've ever played the campaign nor have I given it a chance. I played like 45 it's... minutes of it so I know what you mean. It's behind a paywall too. They've just basically never taken it out of early access beta so no one's basically played the Fortnite single player because no one wants to spend close to a full price just to see if maybe it's worth noting. Mm. So um yeah, actually, nobody. Yeah. <laughs> so I played, oh, I played uh, Fortnite PVE way back in the day when it came out. I actually oh. streamed it before the P- the PVP came out. I I literally got into the alpha or the or I guess it was like right after the alpha into the beta, and I loved it. I loved the the whole tower defense, the building. It was such a, a really interesting and fun thing that they had done, and then. They were like, hey guys, we're coming out with PvP, but don't worry, PvE is still going to get some love. Just kidding! And no one knows about PvE. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's absolutely mm-hmm. no way I will ever stream that game again. Ever. <laughs> yeah. You I guys don't really will have it. to do, there will have to be some act of God for me to play that game on stream again. It did really well, by the way. It, when it came out and I streamed it, it was really good for the channel. And then mm-hmm. they came out with PvP, mm-hmm. and it was not so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Speaking of Fortnite, just a little honorable mention. Um, just before we started the podcast, uh, there was nearly one million people watching Fortnite because of the new 
ending to the season that they're doing the black holes and such i don't really know exactly what's going on because yeah. i'm yeah God. Not really in that world, but there there was about a million people. It was like nine hundred and sixty thousand people on Twitch watching it at one time. Watching up, so, I don't know. I don't, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm not very... really sure what the hell just happened, but uh, some 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 stuff went down just so before I, the podcast went live. The way that the seasons have worked, they usually have like a ramp up between the season, and then afterwards they'll change up some map. I remember, I think it was the difference between it was like the transition from three to four. Um, they added some anti-gravity items into the game and changed up a couple of sections in the map for the Battle Royale. And apparently this change is like, they're getting rid of the original map altogether. They're just done with it. And so they, they wrap it up in spectacular form because they've already had little comets and things coming down and blasting things and causing problems. And It's that's, that's pretty cool. epic. Yeah, I mean, I I think big world events like that work out extremely well. Um, Guild Wars 2 mm -hmm. is a fantastic example of that. Um, I think if I were to take an IP and flip it from single player to multiplayer, I would love to see something like that with a game like uh, Nino Kuni, mm -hmm. where you get a whole bunch of people playing together in an environment to make the world change. Because yeah, that would be pretty cool. That's always been kind of a, a theme of it, is that you're this one person who's going out there and making the world a better place. Well, let's have a whole ton of people do that. Um, hmm. It'd be a different environment. Um, maybe not as... Uh, you always worry with mul massively multiplayer stuff like that, that it's not going to be kid-friendly. So if they found a way to, to control that and fit it into the Nino Kuni universe, I think it'd be... There are ways. There are kid-friendly MMOs that have succeeded. There's just, you know, you have to be very careful with it. They've come up with old chat algorithms and everything to make it be a lot friendlier. Just um, Club Penguin. That's all I need to say. Sure. <laughs> did did um, you uh, frequent Club Penguin? Are you familiar with that? Absolutely not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I have one more. Uh, actually, uh, I have two more things to mention. One is just another bring it back, which is I want us to re-explore the Arkham Orange multi Arkham yeah Arkham Orange Arkham Origins <laughs> multiplayer. The Arkham Origins multiplayer was fantastic. <laughs> Splash Damage did a marvelous job. It is one of the truest translations of the challenge mode in the Arkham games to a multiplayer landscape. They even made a mode where everyone had one life. If Batman got you, you're down. If another goon got you, you're down. And it was just really competitive like i remember back in the day matches were like something you'd expect from an esport kind of like kind of competitive and see we even saw with um gotham city imposters by monolith there's actually a lot of multiplayer potential using the tool set from Batman. i was just thinking that actually mm. i was yeah, just, just thinking like, about if it if you could find some way to capture some of the zanier tone from gotham city imposters but also have some of the impact and the, the asymmetry of Arkham Origins combined, mm -hmm. that would be one of the most compelling multiplayer experiences ever. Then you would succeed where games like Evolve failed horribly. So I would absolutely love that. And additionally, I want to just throw this out here. I know that it did not work in the original game, but they didn't really put any thought into it in the original game. Deus Ex multiplayer. Deus Ex! Like, do this X. Do this. Damn it. Do this X. I'm just gonna keep saying it worse now, just to screw with you. I want you to know that. I hope you appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, it, it, it drives me buggered because it is the perfect game for a class-based experience with objectives. Because the ventilation system is fantastic. It would be like the vents in uh, Republic Commando. You could have a class that's focused on fighting you could have a class that's focused on stealth and hacking and it could be so much like splinter cell spell spot yeah spells versus merc spies versus mercenaries as this guy likes to say we'll get more caffeine words are clearly hard you need it. clearly you need um it. Uh, but seriously uh, it would work so elegantly the mechanics would be fantastic everything's already made to happen rapidly and real in real time in both Mankind Divided and Human Revolution. So it would translate super well. It would fit the fiction wonderfully. And it would bring back, 
blah, blah, it would bring back spies versus mercenaries, okay. which currently is held hostage by Splinter Cell Blacklist. I am going to cut you off here, so you can Me. give your mouth a chance to rest. Oh, no, 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 no. Too many words. You're done. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, so I can get my two cents in on it, um, because I've been waiting. Um, Guns of Icarus. I would love to see a campaign for Guns of Icarus. Dude, what happened to that game? It just straight up died. There's know. like 500 yeah. people ever play that game ever. No, not anymore. But I would love the concept of the game, and I would love to have tried a campaign for it. I think that would have been a lot of fun and a story Look, behind it. They did. They did. I believe. Maybe not. I don't know the timeline here, but it just felt like they did what Black Flag did before Black Flag came out, you know? Yeah. Or even uh, there, will, there is uh, something Wake. It's a pirate game as well. Black Wake. Okay. Um, and, like, that, these games, like, these games that require a crew, mm -hmm. but maybe not necessarily PvP, please... Please, developers. We there is there is a strong, like a very big community out there who would love to play these, but oh, maybe yeah. not necessarily PvP because I came I come from like a a, a StarCraft two background, uh, ladder anxiety and and just Bronze people don't want to they don't want to dirt league for life, baby <laughs> dirt league for life. <laughs> but but yeah, like there are so many people. There's dozens of us. Okay, there are dozens of us who want a game that is like that, like Guns of Icarus, like um the C one <laughs> brain. You know the one, the the pirate one. Uh, sea man for Dreamcast. Yes, yeah, absolutely. that one. Mm hmm. Sea of Thieves. <laughs> See if these. Thank you. Space, Thank he's you. Flashbacks apparently to that terrifying we, game. There, there is dozens <laughs> of us. We, about it earlier. We, we want games like this where it's co-op, not necessarily PvP. And there is a very nice, very large community of people who want that PvP sp stuff. And by all means, include it. But there's definitely some of us who would like a more of a co-op, more like something that we can do together instead of fighting each other all the time mm -hmm. oh yeah oh yeah and well, we like, want something like that you know yeah uh i think based on what i was talking about earlier with the private service was uh sea of thieves um one of the reasons that mm -hmm. it was a discussion is you know what group of what community would probably have a ton of fun with it our peers mm -hmm. absolutely yes yes well, it would be huge Could that's why i'm hoping yeah. That Skull and Bones is gonna be that. I don't know. I don't. I really. Don't, they haven't released like any any information about that game. Right. But dude, I'm. I have. I, I'm crossing my fingers here. I'm hoping that it's it's a good game. If not, well, that's just how it be sometimes. Right. Right. I do. Um. I do actually have want to add one layer. But Mish, if you have anything else you want, to just still say that. But um, I just wanted to also add. Also, is there any game you'd like to see translated to VR? Because I'm just going to say this right now. Namco Bandai, you're sitting on this. It's perfect for VR. Come on. Do it. Flatterhouse VR. But, um, please, continue. I think that's... Uh, actually, you know what? Hold on to that. Put a pin in it, and we'll come back to it for another show, because I think that'd be a good topic. To that discuss. would be really good. That is yeah. actually a really good topic. Yeah. Um. Hold, yeah, put a pin in that one. Uh, especially since uh, that was actually one of my answers uh, for the console thing before, but um, yeah. Oh, oh, Steam actually is. I I just I saw a glance of this. Steam actually, well, I see I see in chat that people are saying, "Hey, bring back uh, couch co-op stuff." I heard oh, yeah. that Steam will be doing something for that. Yeah. Uh, allowing local co-op on the internet? Question mark. I didn't actually get to read the article. Essentially, uh, they're going to be using their same streaming tech that allows you to stream, like, they used to require a Steam link, but they've gotten to the point that you can even stream it to your phone now. And um, they are actually kind of at the forefront of remote streaming. Uh, Microsoft's trying to play catch up with the Xbox One on that, but essentially turns your PC not only into a gaming box, but a streaming box that will just remotely send your stuff to you. So it's like PS Now, but you put the server together yourself and know how reliable it's actually going to be. All right, that's pretty cool. So, oh yes, and uh, I'm, I'm all for off. this. Yes. Yep. So with that, uh, 
since we're just kind of talking about things that we would like to see um let's just go ahead and just i got one more question for you guys um and it's not what's going on uh <laughs> thank you you were all thinking it i know you were uh um, oh yeah no, with 2019 is coming to a close. We got the holiday season coming up. So, what's a game that's still due, due to come out this year that you guys are looking forward to? And uh, Dizza, why don't we start with you? I will pick a game that's kind of off the beaten path because there's a lot of stuff that that I'm super looking forward to. I can't wait until well, when's Final Fantasy VII remake? Like 40 years from now? Maybe not this this <laughs> holiday season. March but but eventually. But but let's take a a small one that that definitely most people wouldn't think of. It's definitely in my wee part though. Um, the new Trails of Cold Steel. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. All right. We're replaying the original right now, um, and I did not realize how stereotypical it was. But it's fun. It's got a unique combat system. I've I've had a lot of fun with the modifiers and, and how they all kind of interact and the link system. Like there's a lot of good flexibility in that to take a turn based RPG and make it interesting. Okay. And um yeah, that that's gonna be, I think, a, a niche hit. Okay. So in in lieu of possibly uh having my answer stolen again <laughs> looking at you uh the, 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 i have two games in particular i'm i'm looking forward to this year still and i think there's a chance for for success from them uh pokemon sword and shield yes no uh, i question. think that'd be a good one uh and the new star wars game mm. in regards to pokemon sword and shield can we take a, a moment here and just Appreciate the wonder that is Sir Fetched. <laughs> I have never wanted to drool over a duck so much as Sir Fetch. He that's, is just dashing. That's that's quackers. Yeah. Um, and and I've I've had duck before, and, and it, it is good, and I've definitely drooled over it, but not as much as Sir Fetched. Oh, that got awkward. Yeah, no, between that and I, I like the I like what could potentially come out of uh Jedi Fallen Order. Um that one looks like it's got a chance to be good. Yeah. Mm. Hippo. Uh I'm actually really excited for Outer Worlds. Um I would oh, like yes. to see what they oh. what they come uh, come out with. Hopefully it's not a flop. I I think that we have some pretty reliable people. Um, mm -hmm. I assume there will be some problems at launch, but it's Obsidian, of course there are. That's a feature at this point. <laughs> I, I expect problems at launch, but I also expect that they will be ironed out within the first month or so. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm very excited to see what comes out of that. I, I really hope that it's as good as uh, we're all hoping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, Elijah. <laughs> Deeply. Why did you say that so reluctantly? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Elijah. You, well, your yeah. choices are safe, Michelle. You're already good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I actually, here's the irony. I'm actually concerned about Jedi Fallen Order simply because I am too much of a Star Wars nerd. I know all of the different things they're pulling from. So as a result, my immediate concern is more how are they adapting this? And is this actually going to go somewhere? Or is the Disney situation going to hinder it like battlefront 2 was where the campaign had to be shifted so i'm actually more concerned there i'm really am excited for the outer worlds i'm gonna go in and say that one also looks fantastic and besides that um well a lot of the stuff that came that was going to be coming out that i was excited for is already hit like left alive and apparently blair which really sucks so what? that was really shame to hear. yeah I'm mm. I, I heard that it was like short but i didn't hear that it sucked uh, I, from what I understand, like the morality was really, really handled, and that I'm actually better off playing the old PC ones than I am playing the new one. Which it does have mixed reviews on Steam, but I mean, I haven't actually like gone over it. It's something that's got me a bit hesitant. I am very curious to see what Chris Avalone does with Dying Light Two because Dying oh Light my God, yes, please, because that could be really potentially really really good i'm hoping that no more heroes 3 comes together nicely because that would also be 
fantastic. And um, really, besides, I'm trying to think of what else really has me excited. And like, I, I want to see Halo Infinite come together. I'd really like for that. But um, really, the I'm trying. I'm trying to think here, just because I know it's going to be like what, not Cyberpunk? It's like no. I'm after The Witcher Three and me bouncing off of that. I'm actually a bit hesitant, but. I'm going to be real here. Even though I people, I am by default expected to not like it, I'm at least curious about The Last of Us Part 2. I am curious. Oh, yeah. to I gotta, see I gotta play the first one still. I have yet to play the first one, but I have it. I own it. It's sitting right here in front of me in my PlayStation. But I've yet to touch it. Been there. The winter section is the best part. Uh, that's all I'm going to say is the winter section is the best part. And the fact that part two looks Me like it's mega. basically the winter section as a game has me excited. It was the least Naughty Dog-esque Naughty Dog game that I've ever played. So that has me excited because supposedly Uncharted 4 and Lost Legacy, I'm going to finally find out about those, obviously. Supposedly those shaked things up in a way that I will be and do so if the last of us part two goes further with that and they don't go with the cliche fridging route that everyone's terrified of it could make for a notable experience it could be something interesting or it'll be a few months down the road and i'll be here going oh my gosh they fucked it up again i mean Wait, where's the sensor beep where's the come on, come on. there you go <laughs> Um, all right. Well, uh, I think we made it. We made it to the end of the show. Holy sh**. We made it. <laughs> we made it. Welcome, guys. Well done. Well done. Um, I, uh... so, Sensor's getting caught up. It's yeah. good. Uh, hmm. Gosh. Before we go, uh, let's go ahead and just go ahead and do a quick round of everyone that's here, what we got coming up on our channels, and then after that, um, when we go into the uh, end scene, we'll announce our raid target. Uh, with that said, we'll start with uh, the Unabridged Gamer. Where's, what's your channel? Where can we find you? And what do you have coming uh, up? Well, pretty much everywhere you can find me is Unabridged Gamer, except for on The Escapist, where you'll find me as Elijah Beam, where I'm doing a second look, where I will take a look at all of the, excuse me, all the uh, mistaken... <laughs> wow misunderstood and abandoned games across the industry because damn it there are way too many games that get tossed to the wayside we're gonna be talking about some really interesting ones for the horror themed lineup in october and i'm really excited for what we're gonna be talking about in the future there's gonna be i will say that there is something coming up involving a certain first person horror series that's gonna take an angle i don't think anybody's expecting that i'm very excited for and also on my channel on the bridge gamer on youtube in the last week of October, we're going to be doing some very special video content there as well. And um, I do feel confident enough to say that one of the games we're going to be featuring foremost is the Blair Witch Trilogy. Yes, Trilogy, because there's a trilogy of games that nobody talks about, has a completely different control scheme than any other horror game you've heard of, and it's actually really fun. So that is going to be exciting to talk about, and there's going to be a special stream... It's being planned for October 31st with more details to come soon once those details have coalesced into bard hardened amber. Until now, just know for certain that, yes, Blair Witch, and also very much, yes, Splatterhouse. Thank you, Hidden Object Guru, for this. All right. Cool. Hippo, what's your channel? What do you uh, got coming up on your channel? Where can we find you? Stuff like that. Well, you can find me Hipponymous right, right below my face. Um... There will be more RimWorld this week. We're also checking out two new games. Uh, the developers gave me a copy of Flotsam, and we'll be playing some Stranded Sails at launch. Um, currently, I can't talk about it, so don't ask. Uh, but we'll be playing those games, um, and yeah, there's going to be more dentist appointments and emergency one too, so I might actually have to take a day off, unfortunately, but I will be back. For Halloween, there will definitely be um, a 12-hour. What's up? How do you plan an emergency appointment? Well, I go in tomorrow at 11, and then I get to talk to them. So, that's oh. how. Uh, but yeah, so 
there will be a 12 hour stream on Halloween because it is literally my favorite holiday of the entire year. So we'll be playing spoopy games and I may or may not have a costume that I have planned already. Oh my um, oh my. Yeah. And uh, basically going to just be streaming like every holiday this year okay. for 12 hours. You're That's not pretty busy. much it. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Columbus Day? That's, That's not really a holiday. But yeah, okay, good. There I you go. Maybe I'll, that, that is that is the right answer. Yes, <laughs> I might be streaming that day. I don't even know what day that is. Tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Oh, I won't be streaming that day. I will be getting a kind of, uh, <laughs> I'm getting a root canal. It is Good Monday, my dudes, and I will be having a root canal. That's how you celebrate Good Monday with a root canal. Right. So, okay, it's very grim dark. Is all I'm saying. Is a G. Where can we find you? What do you got coming up on your channel? Excellent. Um, as stated before, I am Dizzy. I am found on the internet pretty much everywhere. You can find me on Twitch primarily, where on Tuesdays and Thursdays we've been playing Astral Chain. We'll wrap that up here shortly and get to something spoopy. I'm thinking maybe some Darkest Dungeon, because that's always a lot of fun and always spoopy. Um, on off days, I've been playing a lot of Slay the Spire lately, so if you do catch me on a one-off, like, uh, Monday or Saturday, that's usually what's going on. But definitely stop on by. Um, you can also find me on Twitter and pretty much everywhere where the internet is. Thing. Cool. And for myself, uh, if you're watching live, you already found me, Miss Michelle Jean, 1L Michelle. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm on Twitch, twitch.tv slash MissMichelleJean. If you're on uh, iTunes or SoundCloud, that is where I'm at. Um, I will be doing more GTRP. we got to get back into Elite Dangerous as well. we got a big content patch coming up in a couple months, so we need to kind of get back to the bubble. We're 21,000 light years away from it right now. <laughs> so we got some and a lot of travel data. A lot. Uh, last time we played Elite Dangerous, we found over 12 new neutron stars that were brand new and previously undiscovered. I got a lot of data. I saw that eyebrow oh, glitch, yeah. so you know what I have. Uh, so we're going to get that back. Um, looking at another space game. Uh, looking to dip back into No Man's Sky a little bit in the near future, too. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still figuring it out, but Synth Riders? Question mark? We'll see. Right. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what's coming up here. Again, Mr. Michelle Jean on all the channels. Uh, that being said, for the Unabridged Gamer, for Hippo Anonymous, and for Dizzy, my name is Miss Michelle Dean. This has been the Noobcast Podcast. Thank you so much for watching, and have a fantastic night.